this is probably the, the gravest mistake that a real estate investor can make is you do some deals, you do some flips, then you take your own capital and then you reinvest it. This is mm -hmm. the worst way to get rich ever. Land has trillions of dollars of dead equity. Mm -hmm. It's dead. Hey everybody, thank you for joining us for today's episode of Real Estate Disruptors. Today we have Daniel Martinez and Anthony Guyona with Hivemind, and they flew in from San Antonio, Texas to talk about why land is the best investment. It's a pretty bold claim, so we'll see where this goes. Guys, I'm on a mission to create 100 millionaires. The information on the show alone is enough to help you become a millionaire. In the next five to seven years, you'll take consistent action. You will become one. Guys, if you get value out of the show, please hit that subscribe button. Stop keeping us a secret. That way we can help and grow more people together. Uh, you guys ready? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. All right. So uh, start with you, Daniel. Uh, what was life like right before you got into real estate? Oh, man, I was a, I was a truck driver. So um, that's actually how we met. So we met September 2019. I drove a truck out here to come to your first sales 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 uh, mm -hmm. trainings. Yeah. So it's been an interesting journey being here full circle four and a half years later. So it's interesting. I'm excited. I still remember you driving the truck all the way out from Atlanta. <laughs> right. I was probably as my little one that's done that. Mm -hmm. You're the only one that drove a semi across the country. <laughs> I, I don't know how many drove across the country, but you're definitely the only one that drove an actual truck across the country because I still remember you were out there as me, you pace yep right i think stratton might have been there yep. uh but we had a couple people that came for a live sales training yep. and uh we all took a picture next to your semi yeah. <laughs> i don't have that picture i was actually trying to hope they put it on the podcast maybe they'll find it and put it on later oh yeah. um i don't have it so i only have a picture of me pace and uh sage eric sage yeah so um, we might have to hit up pace because i think pace is the one that took the picture oh so there it yeah. is i don't have it so we have proof if we can get it did pace. it happen yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but I still remember, right? Guys, like, you know, Pace and I, we did our, you know, 5, 5 a.m. runs, and only a handful of people did it, and you drove a truck across the country. Oh, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, mentioned, I forgot about that. I drove to the park. <laughs> yeah, you drove to the I park. I took, like, three, three parking spots, and I mentioned did. the park at 5 a.m. A lot of parking. <laughs> well, because, like, there. I'm not a morning person, and since I was on the East Coast at that time, I was like, hey, I might as well go to the park, and I was with the fat boys at the back, at the back of the line, because <laughs> everybody's running the mile like all the skinny guys are all running, running, running. And I'm like, I'm going to stick with the fat boys because I'm out yeah. of breath. <laughs> yeah, we did break out in the separate groups. I think you were with, uh, I mean, no offense here. Uh, I think you were with Bryant <laughs> yeah. right? uh, at that time. So, or maybe it was Brian and Simmons. I, I remember it was both of them. There you go. Perfect. And then, uh, so, but you're, you're a truck driver. So what was that life like before you, you know, jumped in real estate? Man, uh, my first business was actually a trucking business. So I started a trucking business. Uh, I was a truck driver before that. And then I, I was transitioning to real estate. And that's where I kind of met you. So I had all the time in the world to like listen to podcasts. So I'm actually a product of real estate disruptors. And yeah. it's come full circle here. So I'm excited. Oh, it's definitely come full circle. How about you? Um, same thing, man. Um, what, what, was this a background question? Yeah, yeah. What, 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 what was your life like before you got into real estate, right? Like what was, what were the tribulations or dreams or whatever? Like why? Real estate. Man, I, I kind of, it was just a big fluke, I think. So I was in construction my whole life. Like, mm -hmm. I was a, I was boxing at the time. I thought I was going to be a famous boxer. I'm like 12 years old. And my dad's like, get in the truck. You're going to work. <laughs> so now I'm working for my dad's company, painting, painter's helper, that kind of stuff. I got really, really good at construction um, and lead generation, right? So eventually I got to the point to where, you know, with my dad's company, it was either feast or famine. Like mm -hmm. we had a lot of money or no money at all. And a lot yeah. of work or no work at all. So I always found myself doing marketing, always reaching out to contractors, trying to find new work so that we could eat that kind of stuff, important mm -hmm. things. Um, so. Fast forward to 2018, I'm doing commercial roofing, right? So we'll do like a million dollar roof on a building. Mm -hmm. um, I was running a, a big roofing company with just my cell phone. So I'm doing all of the marketing, right? I have a professional marketing background for like 15 years. Um, but, you know, my friends were running multi-million dollar roofing companies, but they all had like construction crews and warehousing, office staff and all this. And it's just me and the cell phone running like bigger companies than that. Mm -hmm. uh, what I was doing is I was like helping sue the insurance company. And then I would collect the funds and I would just wholesale the job to another roofing company. Gotcha. Let them do it, knock everything out. Um, yeah. So I got to the point where with my family, I was looking to build a house mm -hmm. and I get on YouTube and I Googled, how do you buy land for cheap? Right. And I came across the term wholesaling. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm doing these big roofing projects. Right. And it takes like six months for fulfillment, but these guys are getting real estate contracts and then just selling them instantly mm -hmm. and then making similar money. So I was like, I'm going to do this. Right. Yeah. So just the grace of God, man, I got lucky. Uh, one of my first deals on a 46 acre land deal made uh, $85,000. Yeah. I'm like, I'm so probably not going to do houses. <laughs> So you were doing arbitrage, I mean, we call it wholesale, but you're already sourcing opportunities and selling those opportunities without fulfillment. Yeah. 
Gotcha. <laughs> and it was in construction. That's all I knew. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, and that's your background. So, um, so you saw, uh, you're looking to buy land for development. Development is that what you said? To build a, a house for my own family. Build a house for yourself. Yeah. Gotcha. And then you saw along the way, it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> These guys are buying real estate and selling real quick. Mm-hmm. So then what was that jump like then? Tell me like, you know, what was the, how long from when you saw that till you actually did your first deal? When you started your real estate business, it was with the dream to change the world and make an impact. The reality is you might not be near that. If you're like many investors, you might be frustrated. You just can't succeed in getting your salespeople to do what they know that they should do. They operate on their own terms, meaning they don't follow your process that you know produces consistent results. So each month feels like a roller coaster because revenue is coming in inconsistently. How relieving would it be if your salespeople did follow your proven process, were receptive to feedback and training, and could be held accountable to the results that leads to their success and your success? Would your company stop riding in the roller coaster of revenue, frustration, and mental drain? And that's why we brought in Ren Bartlett. He's built a business that's wholesaled 100 plus houses a month. The people he brings into his business are bought into the process. They have a deep understanding of their role and are excited to be held accountable because as a business owner, he truly knows their deeper why so that we can demonstrate that our company is here to provide for their true purpose. If you'd like to finally stop dreading managing people who don't follow a process produce inconsistent results and aren't bought into your company, sign up for our sales leadership program to end the emotional stress of inconsistent results and finally have a fulfilling business working with people you want to be around. Dude, so I'm an all-in kind of guy, right? I don't think about things. So I think what I lack in like intelligence or whatever, I just make up for in pure action. Mm-hmm. So I'm learning about wholesaling like mid-December. By January 1, I launched like $30,000 worth of marketing. Because I already knew I was going to get a deal. I've been, I've been doing marketing for too long. I knew if I spent enough on marketing, for uh-huh. sure I'm going to get a contract. There's no way right. that I couldn't. So I want to say it took me like five weeks to get my first contract. Mm-hmm. When I, when I, I did My first pull ever was 500,000 records. And I RVM'd it, texted it, hired a VA, everything. I, I ordered like a thousand bandit signs, made mm-hmm. a bandit sign maker. My wife's right there. She drove me around while I'm hanging up bandit signs. Like I went all in, dude, 110% in. Yeah. And I got a contract pretty quick. But I already knew like if I, if I ran across enough leads, I'd eventually get a deal. <laughs> I called everybody in San Antonio, like all the gurus, and I had lunch with all of them, told them what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So I identified who had like, who's good at sub two, who's good at commercial, who's good at land. And so anytime I got that type of deal or lead, I would take it to that person and go have lunch with them and give it away. So there's no middle of the road with you? No. Either all in or all out. (laughs) Anybody that knows me, I'm I'm an all in kind of guy. Yeah. Okay. And then you immediately connected with all the gurus or the experts. Mm Inside of San Antonio. Yeah. There's a lot of them in San Mm -hmm. Antonio. I don't know why there's so many in San Antonio, (laughs) but there are a lot of them. For you to say that is crazy. Yeah. Phoenix is crazy. Well, Phoenix is nuts as well. But (laughs) to me, Phoenix makes sense. I don't know. And I could just be in my own world, right? But, you know, we kind of all, you know, in some way, this is going to be a kind of weird way to describe it, but we're all like little like descendants of Sean Terry, right? Like <laughs> he was the big one and then we all kind of like followed his footsteps. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In San Antonio, I don't think you guys have that. I don't think you have like one person you guys can all point to. No. Logan Former? No. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a really, really good market. With It's ripe with opportunity. I feel like it's mm-hmm. the last Texas major city that's like been uh, unindustrialized or yeah. it hasn't been abused yet. Yeah, Lots of you, green space. You talk about, you know, like the creative, right? Because you got Charles, you got Michael, mm-hmm. um, you got uh, Logan. Logan, I mean, Logan and commercial. Yeah, right. I mean, he's, he's insane uh, with commercial. He's supposed to be coming on sometime in the very near future. Uh, I'm trying to think who is him. Um, you got Bevins there. You got yeah. uh, Mitzi. You got a, there's a bunch of names there. Oh, uh, Mitzi's there too? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For some reason, I thought she was in Dallas. Um, but yeah, I mean, you guys have like a lot of names out there. So you immediately just <laughs> go all in on marketing <laughs> and then you meet all the uh, wholesalers that you mm-hmm. can just sell deals to. I mean, that sounds like the ideal action. So how'd that work out? Uh, amazing, actually, man. So I have a, a network marketing, like multi-level marketing background. Okay. So I already knew you, you get around <laughs> the people that are doing well, and uh-huh. then you just learn from them. Yeah. So that's what I did. I bought them all lunch, bought them all steaks, uh-huh. right? Yeah. <laughs> Went to lunch with everybody, and I immediately started just like, they, they took me under their wing. They saw mm-hmm. that I, I actually brought something to the table. Right. So I didn't show up and say, hey, what can you give me? How can you uh-huh. help me? Pick I came, your, and I said, hey, pick, I have a lead. Pick your brain. Don't say that. Yeah. <laughs> Don't ever say that to anybody you want to yeah. learn from. Don't say pick your brain. Uh, so I, I brought them the lead mm-hmm. and uh, they would just automatically start teaching me. I'll say, here, like, what do you want for? Like, I don't care, but you're going to teach me. <laughs> yeah. So MLM background, yeah. um, outside the construction component. Mm-hmm. So were you successful in the MLM? 
Rome. Dude, so I joined my first company. I think I was like 17 or 18. It was like USANA, mm -hmm. those kinds of guys. Mm -hmm. And I bombed at everything. Didn't sign up anybody. And I'll like call your friends and family and sign. This is not my personality type. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there was a company called Empower Network. There's a guy named David Wood. And uh, I was going to join that company. It was like a blogging based MLM. It was weird. I want to say it was probably 12 years ago or something. Yeah. I was looking to join the company, but I didn't know how to join. I didn't know what their website was. I didn't know anything, but I wanted to follow this guy. So I found a video on YouTube where the gentleman was talking about like, hey, join my team in MLM. And he had his phone number in the, in the description of the video. Mm -hmm. I was like, this is genius. So I called him. I'm like, dude, I'm gonna join. I want to join Empower Network. I want to join your team. He's mm -hmm. like, perfect. Sign me up. Good. And he did coaching. He had all kinds of cool stuff. But it, it, like the, the, the light bulb came on. It's like, man, I know how to do MLM now. Mm -hmm. So I shut it down. I wasn't real, too, too interested in the product after a while. But when I found a, a company called Power that I did want to you know, blow up in, mm -hmm. Uh, I did the same exact strategy. I ran a YouTube video. I ran ads to it, put my number in there. And uh, randomly, one day, calls, somebody calls me. They said, hey, you signed up four people in two days. How'd you do it? And I'm like, I did? <laughs> so people were converting without me even talking to them. Yeah. So I, I nailed it, dude. I became one of the top guys in the company right away. Yeah. And uh, I figured, like, yeah, this marketing thing's starting to go good. <laughs> That's awesome. And the only reason I'm asking this is that, you know, MLM has a really bad rap, uh, rap right? Uh, and I can't <laughs> say it's undeserved. Even though I'm in one, I can't say it's undeserved, right? <laughs> Um, but the great thing about MLM is that most of the people that were successful in MLMs go off to do other things well, mm -hmm. right? Because, I mean, like you look at entrepreneurship and, you know, do my own thing and uh, do my marketing, doing this. Like you have to learn all these things, mindset, that you don't get in a W2 world, right? I mean, like I, leadership I, too. Leadership. So I yeah. say, you know, between MLM and college, like probably MLM, even though it's not. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's a big statement. Yeah. Even though it's not necessarily the best reputation. So. <laughs> So you said you started in December. Um, Mid-December, you said? was your Yeah, so I just started learning, yeah. When was that exactly? What year? 18. Okay, so mid-December 18. What is this thing? January, let's just drop 30,000 in marketing. <laughs> February, you do your first day. You said 80-something? Um, I got my first contract was actually a house. And uh -huh. I, I got into it with a broker and agent. They walked with me, helped me drop the contract. It took months to close. That was okay. contract number one. Okay. I want to say the second one was a, it was a 46-acre farm south of Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. And again, I called the people that I thought might be able to help. They, they kind of walked me through it. Mm -hmm. I did a novation deal. Didn't know what the heck that was, but we gave the sellers a certain amount down. Mm -hmm. She signed it over to me. I listed it, sold 85K. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So that's pretty impressive. So um, there is the way you were saying, you know, I just dropped 30,000 because I knew this was going to work. Mm -hmm. but there was never a moment of doubt in your head whether this was going to work or not. I had to, uh, my marketing background was so extensive. Like I said, I, I know like you spend enough dollars and you get kind of conversions. <laughs> you don't have, you have to be a genius. Yeah. <laughs> you, could, you could just be Joe Blow. So yeah, yeah. I was very 100% sure that, that we were going to do some business. Gotcha. All right. So then how about you? Like how long from like, I'm going to do it to. So we, we actually got the same course in December. We both started around January, same time. Um, he told me to start looking to land because he got that, that quick deal quick. Mm -hmm. He had marketing. Then. I didn't have marketing. Then. I had a couple months. And, uh, I contracted a few houses, didn't work out. I had three contracts fall through. Two was like twenty thousand dollar assignment. He fell through. Uh, one seller died yeah, right, right before closing. That. Right before closing, I had another one. I went through through foreclosure. I evicted the tenant, crashed it out, fixed the closing. I was making like twenty five thousand. Then fell apart. Closed. Crazy. And then he's like, "Just try land, see what happens." So literally within like two weeks, I put a carrot site up and mm -hmm. um, the Google ads lady came in. I was afraid of sales. So I was like emailing her, <laughs> emailing her, emailing her. I got the, <coughs> sorry, I'm so sick. I'm a little irritated. So uh, I got the contract um, through email, found a buyer on Facebook marketplace in, in two days, sold it, made six grand and the rest is history. No, no houses, no house deals, all land. The first deal you locked up <coughs> was through email. Through email, 100%. You never talked to her on the phone, never texted her. <laughs> I never talked to the buyer either. So that tells you, like, this tells you how our relationship goes. Mm -hmm. is that I'm a lot of the back end. He's a front end sales, contracting and all that stuff. So I, I do, like, agent calls now and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I've gotten, I've kind of grown this muscle. But back then, man, I was afraid to talk to anybody. Okay. So then you guys connected pretty soon thereafter. Like, you guys said you, said you guys were in the same course. Yeah, so Jalen White, we mm -hmm. both took Jalen White's course back in 2019. Yeah. So that's how we connected. So you guys connected. How soon from when you connected to you guys started working together? Immediately, dude. It was like a year in. 
It was yeah, like a year. Well, ago. we were always networking. So we were always networking and communicating. I think I posted in the group something about like, hey, is anybody <clears> doing <throat> land? And of course, crickets, right? And then Daniel's like, hey, some land. And so we just started talking and uh -huh. we, we stayed connected. I noticed that he was really good at numbers, right? So if I'm running comps, right, I'm just running there with like half a brain, like, hmm, I could figure it out sooner or later. I took pre-cal in college. Yeah. Um, so, but I would notice when I would send him something and he, he would send back the comps like within minutes. I was like, the heck did this guy do? Mm -hmm. And then anytime there was anything that was numbers, percentages, anything, he would come back in like seconds. And I'm like, okay, that's something that might've taken me 30 minutes, an hour, and this guy's not getting it out quick. So we immediately identified each other's strengths and he'd be like, hey, can you call the seller for me? I got this lead. Mm -hmm. So we immediately just started leaning on each other back and forth. So it was, it was a hive mind since day one. Yeah. Okay. So you guys were uh, closely working together from the get-go. Uh, how many deals did you guys collaborate on before you guys decided, like, you know what, let's just be partners? I want, it was I probably mean, like five. I was going to say, yeah, it was, it, was like, it was just a few, just a handful. But we, all, we just started leaning on each other immediately. Like, hey, yeah. I need earnest money for this. Hey, I need a, can you help me with this contract? Like, just mm -hmm. right away. Um, we just kind of felt that vibe and he never asked me like hey well what's in it for me mm -hmm. and i never asked him either like what's in it for you we just we just automatically started clicking and uh i would say we started the hive mind thing <coughs> just over three years ago mm -hmm. and i had yeah. this business idea and it 2021 was, it was like one in the morning and i'm telling daniel about it and he's like that's a great effing idea i'm like it mm -hmm. sure is isn't it <laughs> yeah yeah so it was, it was kind of just all very fluid man Strange. sure yeah so then uh <coughs> after a, a few deals and about a year you guys decided to partner up yeah. So it was then, a loose partnership. We didn't sign agreements or nothing. We were, we were just helping each other. It was a handshake gotcha. agreement. Okay. <laughs> uh, is that still a handshake agreement or is the things they're writing now? No, now we got joint LLCs, trust, all that stuff. <laughs> okay. yeah. yeah. All right. So, what are some of the challenges you guys had initially working together? Um, I think we work really well together because, like, he has the strengths and I have my strengths. So, we work like that yin and yang side mm -hmm. of it. So, um, we really, like, we never really, we, even to this day, we don't fight about stuff because. We're both just working. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't have to ask him, like, what did you do today? I'm like, he doesn't ask me what I did today. Right. Like, we're both just working. And I live in California, too, and he lives in San Antonio, so. Yeah, that's right. You moved to California. Yeah. Um, okay, so then you guys bought Jalen White's course. Yeah. Right? And then you guys get out there and you hit it hard. And then you also talk to a bunch of other, you know, mentors in your market. What mm -hmm. else? Who, who was instrumental in helping you guys, you know? It was the right direction. everybody. I mean, it was, I think land was the wrong direction. I think you kind of go down that path and you start coming across problems. Mm -hmm. The best way is doing the action of it. Mm -hmm. And then you come across different problems. You come, you do like title situations and I call Logan. And he was mentioning Logan before Logan even started going out there. So he was like, oh, how do we fix the title problem? And he was like, oh, we got to do this, this, and this. And he told me, okay, we got to do this, this, and this. So we kind of worked through the problems. Yeah. And then we, uh, we got sub two. He talked to Uncle Charles and Mike. Mm -hmm. Boom, boom, boom. We're working through Creative Sub 2. Now we understand Creative Sub 2, Trouble Title. And then we started looking for flip opportunities. And then we're just focusing on land and then doing all this other stuff that goes down the line with it. Mm -hmm. And you get, eventually get better over time and you see new opportunities. Yeah. yeah. I would say the people that were instrumental for one, Logan Fulmer and his partner, Ryan McDonald. Mm -hmm. yeah, Ryan, I mean, or me like this now. I, I probably talked to him multiple times per week. But it was them two, uh, Mike and Charles, for sure. They both spent a lot of time with me when I was a new kid. Like, I, was, I wasn't even doing deals yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Charles mm -hmm. stayed till like, 9 o'clock at night one time, like, on a Friday or Saturday. It was yeah. crazy. And he just got off the whiteboard and just mm -hmm. went to town. So Mike and Charles, for sure. Logan and Ryan. Uh, Mitzi went with me to lunch a bunch of times. Uh, Corey Thompson, man. He's oh, one yeah. of the guys that took us under his wing. And, like, he's, you know, he could be a little abrasive, right? It's a little. Hard, hard to get in his good graces. <laughs> but whatever reason, man, we just clicked since day one. And I just, I just like how genuine he is and honest yeah. he is. Yeah. So, yeah, I think some of those names. And I'm sure there's a lot more. And somebody's going to cuss me out after this. Yeah. But those are the ones that I could think of It was of a right lot away. of people. And mm -hmm. it, was, it, was, yeah. it wasn't, like, any one person. Even you. Because you, with the podcast, we learned stuff from your guest. Mm -hmm. So, like, it was a culmination of a lot of different things. And I think a lot of people, they get stuck in that one. Like, I think uh, Make War with Many Counselors. Mm -hmm. And, like, we never met or talked to some of these people, even people your guests. But it was just one of those things where we got different information from all over the place and kind of pieced it together based off of what we were doing in our business today. And that's how we kind of came up with what we do. I'll tell gotcha. you, I was watching Real Estate Disruptors, like, every episode, like, binge-watching, dude, for, like, a whole year. Like, no TV, no radio, nothing. I was watching your show, and I was like, this is freaking amazing. Like, I'm going to yeah. be on that show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love that. Um, so, yeah, and you talk about Charles. Uh, I mean, Charles is the guy that, you know, he'll take his shirt off your back, uh, off his back to – to really help you out, right? It's yeah. Totally selfless. And you talk about Corey Thompson. Um, I love Corey. I love Corey too. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's like a brother to me, dude. Yeah. He's, uh, he's, a, he's, he's a great BS detector. Yeah. Uh, he does, and, and he'll call you out on it. <laughs> he'll call you out on it. Um, he might be wrong sometimes. Yeah. And he'll admit it. 
Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, and then, you know, he's like the baller busters for real estate. Um, <laughs> so we keep, that's why we keep them close. So we, we, we do, an, we do an annual event every year and Corey spoke every year yeah. and he'll bring his own little entourage with him and we'll have fun. And it's just, it's a fun time with him. He's always a, he always brings his own little spark. With yeah. Him. He's a character and uh, yeah, he's not, he's, he's not afraid to, to speak his mind. Absolutely. Okay. So um, you said that you started doing land and then there's other things that come along with it. Mm-hmm. So your f- core focus is still land. It's still land, but like different versions of land. Like when we first started, it was like flipping. Then we got like creative financing, mm-hmm. seller financing, wraps, and then it turned into like a subdivide. And now we're doing entitlements. So it's like we kind of went down that path. And the deeper you go down, the door opens up a little bit more. And you mm-hmm. kind of see like, oh, that's interesting. Let's, let's try and do that. So like we've learned like our land knowledge is a exponential and we're still learning like even we talked to our engineer today and the engineer's like da, 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 da. oh that's amazing we should look more for that opportunity mm-hmm. so like as we as we go further down into it we're learning and becoming very skilled at it yeah so you're talking about like you know this engineer spouting these ideas so like what is like your latest rabbit hole you guys are going through? <laughs> the latest rabbit hole has to be the actual entitlement process itself mm-hmm. yeah right because uh we could take a hundred acre ranch buy it for a million dollars Survey it off into several pieces, flip it, sell some for cash, some for notes. Mm-hmm. Amazing deal. And you can make yeah. a couple hundred grand to a million dollars just doing that alone. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to entitlements, now we're looking at flood zone and endangered species. And you're going down all these different, like what the text dots, like Texas Department of Transportation. Roads. Um, dealing with the county, putting in roads, like <clears throat> soil compaction, you know, like all these smugs. Like this leads to a lot of different places. Mm-hmm. So that's probably been like the biggest count of worm we've ever opened. So we're not yeah. going to change our business model. We're going to keep cutting up branches mm-hmm. in Texas. But again, it's like, do you want to make 500000 on this deal or do you want to push it to like $5 million profit on this deal? Mm-hmm. Same exact deal yeah. right? without ever breaking ground. So that's right. why we're trying to look at both things without completely changing our core business model. Yeah. And, and entitlement is, you know, um, it's a crazy concept. You know, um, I first heard about entitlements, I want to say in like 2009, 10, 11 or whatever on there. Right. Mm-hmm. And it was a different situation because then they couldn't even give land away. <laughs> right like you had land you couldn't even give it away because it's upside down before you even buy and take it right yeah so they couldn't sell the land they could only sell it for the cost of entitlement so i was like dang hey you know you give me the eight thousand dollars i spent on entitlement you can have the land for free right? that's the way it was it was because <laughs> wow. again we're talking about this is after the real estate crash uh, and all the developers that had the money to buy all these things they killed it yeah but most people didn't have the kind of cash right yeah. so but yeah, I mean, uh, for everyone that's listening right now, they may not be familiar with entitlement. I know you kind of kind of hit some things here, but for the people that are listening, that are unfamiliar with entitlements, because I think this is this could be a huge opportunity for somebody that's listening. Yeah. What is entitlement? Yep. So it's the process of taking a raw piece of land, right? So let's mm-hmm. say you you get in any major city, you drive down any main highway that leaves the city. Uh, we go right past the neighborhoods, and then we go to to the land where it's just raw land, the farm. You see some cows out there, some horses, <laughs> some goats if you're in Texas, probably in a lot of other places. Yeah. But uh, you take that raw piece of land, and then you repurpose it. So it could be zoned, like, unzoned. It could be agricultural. It could be residential if it's inside the city. Mm-hmm. You take it, and uh, you apply with the county, the city, everybody that wants to talk to you, the fire marshal, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, you usually hire an engineer. You rezone it, so you, you repurpose it. So let's say it was residential, single-family residential as houses. You throw a couple hundred grand at it, and mm-hmm. now the city says, hey, you can build apartments here. Mm-hmm. So the same piece of land without ever breaking dirt goes in value of 250000 to $8 million, mm-hmm. right? Just within a, maybe a year, year and a half time span and a couple hundred thousand dollars. So you just repurpose the land um, and get everybody to approve you for doing a different use for that property. All right. Yeah. And the, the developers like it, too, because they don't have to wait for that timeline of actually doing that work. So the, they'll come in and like, hey, I can buy this today and put a shovel in it tomorrow. Okay, I'm going to buy the opportunity. Mm-hmm. So that's what they're looking for. The guys for. with the money don't want to wait. So they buy back their time by paying you to do the entitlement process. Right. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I heard someone do a presentation on this at, at Collective Genius. Um, I want to say about, I, about a year ago, maybe less. But yeah, that was, that was his business model. So he would just buy yeah. land. He would get it entitled. And he would sell it without ever putting a shovel in the ground. But for him, it was always, he would buy it subject to entitlement. Mm-hmm. Right. So, like, hey, I will buy this land if I can get the entitlement approved. But if I can't get the entitlement approved, you can have it back. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. 
So furthermore, that, we'll give you the we'll give you all the paperwork you paid for. Yeah. And as we shake hands and, and leave, but it's also a good way to lose fifty or hundred grand if you don't know what you're getting yourself into. If you don't know what you're doing, yeah. Yes, it can be really expensive because yeah. you're you're spending a lot of money to get something approved that might never get approved. Absolutely. Yep. So we're both gambling. Like you gamble, you mm -hmm. give me a year of your time and your property for a year, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna put in a couple hundred grand or fifty mm -hmm. grand, whatever the number is, mm -hmm. and then hopefully on the back end we both make profit. But if yeah. not. I give you all that paperwork, we shake mm -hmm. hands as friends, and I'm out of here. Exactly. Yeah. So now you mentioned that you're trying to figure out a <laughs> business model. Do I want to keep doing what I'm doing or do I want to do entitlement? Mm -hmm. What are the factors we're considering and trying to figure out whether you want to entitle or not? So I, I want to cover a little bit back into this. So we kind of do, we when we first started, we did not start with entitlements. It's very high level thing that we got to so we're, we're just talking about the rabbit hole right now we're oh. still we still have to go back to the land okay okay <laughs> yeah the, la the land the land is crazy so you can find flip opportunities to make six, eight six figure spreads pretty easily and they're out there uh, i just interviewed a, a client slash student of ours he found a two hundred thirty thousand dollar deal for 30 grand sold it for 30 grand down he's making 4500 a month for 60 months mm -hmm. net cash flow yeah so if you want to talk about cash that's flow, a lot of houses. That's a lot. That's a lot. Of, that's a lot of cash flow <laughs> with no maintenance, repairs, nothing. So, like, I, 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 I'm always, I love Twitter. So I'm always like beating up people. Like somebody tweeted today is like, oh, uh, what's the best investment class to to invest in? No, they said what what to stay away from. I think. No, no. What, what's the best investment class to invest in? Wrong but, answers. Wrong only. answers only. So I put <laughs> SFR. <laughs> And then everybody's like, oh, why SFR? Because I'm like, it doesn't cash flow. Like mm -hmm. when your AC or roof goes out, there goes two years of cash flow. Mm -hmm. So with, with land, you can add value or find value through arbitrage at pricing. And you can create notes and create like a crazy yield out of nothing mm -hmm. that doesn't even exist. And like, what do your end buyers do with it? I don't know. It's not my business. My business right. is writing good paper mm -hmm. at good property. So it's like you can do flips to create large amounts of value and you can do create cash flow to create large amounts of cash flow mm -hmm. and that's why land is the best asset class. so i want to get back to that the, the factors on entitlement mm -hmm. what are you considering okay so we have a first of all we have a, a lens that we view deals through mm -hmm. yeah now, the quickest way to do it is a 10 acre subdivide right again you buy 100 acres you cut it up <sighs> sell it that's lens number one if we can do that profitably now we're interested in the deal um but now we're going to look at things like, does the property have sewer connections, yeah. right? What's it zoned for? What kind of, does it have groundwater? How close to the city is it, right? What's going up around it? Front so all those things we, we, we could learn to decide. So right now we picked up a ranch for 8,000 acres, like $2 million. And uh, we noticed that everything in that area is going for 20 plus thousand dollars an acre. How do we know? Because we sold one right up the road, mm -hmm. right? So now we're like, okay, we can cut this thing up. We can sell it. We can make, make about a million cash in like 12 months or so. But if we spend about 500000 on engineering, <laughs> right, mm -hmm. um, now we're getting offers for right under $5 million, right, right on something that we paid $2 million for. So it's mm -hmm. like, do we want to hold on to it and, and push this thing to like two to three to $4 million? Or do we want to just grab the million and move on to the next one? So right. I think it depends on demand, right, uh, what area you're in. If this mm -hmm. thing was a 10 more minutes south, we might not have done any entitlements at all. Just chop it up, sell it, move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's probably the, the most important thing is like, hey, how much time and cash would we invest into this thing? And how what, what kind of exponential return can we pull out? Right. And that's probably the biggest indicator is like the return, hey, return on cash, return on time. There you go. Yeah. So should, should we put actually 12 months into this thing and, and make the, the, the return go up 3x? Like, yeah, this, this is a great area, great mm -hmm. opportunity, lots of development happening around there. You know, 10 minutes outside the city mm -hmm. this is perfect. Yeah. The 10 acre lot so divide, we did one in under 90 days, contracted it, sold it 90 days. So that's the quickest way to cash. So within the land space that we do. So we always look through that first lens, like you said. So are you looking at land and then see if you can turn these into 10 acre? 10 acre plus lots. Sometimes it's 20, sometimes it's 30, but I think how popular the land is, we mm -hmm. can cut it up without going through county approval in Texas. Why? So this is probably the single most important thing. If you, let's say you took a 20 acre lot and you cut it down into one acre lots, that's a year. I don't care how you look at it, nine mm -hmm. months to a year, right? On a small piece of land. Mm -hmm. But if you took a 200 acre plot, and cut it up as long as you stay above 10.01 acres in texas it'll be done like in two months mm -hmm. maybe three months total and you're out the door so sometimes we're, we have we're sold out before we have to close All right right so so it's something uh particular in texas where you want to be over 10 acres where uh, the the red tape 
is it's a lot not, shorter. It's non-existent. Yeah. From what I've been told or what we've been told, it works like in 18 states, probably mm-hmm. red states, right? Yeah. But uh, that's, that's where it's a, it's a pretty simple game. As long as you cut out big pieces, nobody bothers you. They're not worried about it. Like, we can fix it later if you make a mistake. Yeah. Right? But once you start cutting up one and two acre tracks, now it affects drainage. It affects the neighbors. Like, you got a whole, whole other set of problems that are coming in. So, guys, so that's for all the calculations. There's a lot of different governing bodies that want to take a look at it. Yeah. yeah. And that makes total sense. Right? Because how many houses can you actually fit on this? But 10 acres, whatever, we'll figure it out. One acre lots, all right, well, what's the density? How much water are they going to need? And so on. That's Everything. what you're talking about. Yeah. Everything. So we find there's limited water. There's like just different challenges. Like the city will be like, hey, there's only a three-inch water line there. Like we're not going to be able to give you 180 meters. Mm-hmm. Right? We can give you six. Like, oh, dang, let's pump 20-acre track. Let's do it. Right? Mm-hmm. So quick in and out depending on what's around us and, again, how far we are from civilization. All right. Gotcha. <laughs> that makes total sense. Uh, so you're talking about the cash flow component. Yeah. Um, and then – the guy is buying it seller finance and selling it owner finance. So right now we try and acquire seller finance. Mm-hmm. So that $2 million deal, we got it for $500,000 down. Mm-hmm. 0% financing, 1.6 carry debt from the seller, payments 4500 a month. If we go through and subdivide those lots into 10 acre lots all the way through, it might produce 20000 a month cash flow and we mm-hmm. give 4500 to the seller. Mm-hmm. So like we have opportunities to create through seller financing because Land is underserviced when it comes to financing. Very, very underserviced. You can get, there's billions and billions of dollars for every other asset class, but nothing for land. The banks won't even lend on it. Underserviced for financing. Yeah. I'm right. on the buy and sell side. Right. So sellers are kind of stuck in a rock, between a rock and a hard place because no one can buy it unless you have cash. And if you buy it cash, they're going to get it discounted. Mm-hmm. And if they buy it financed, uh, it's really hard to get bank financing as a whole. So we're, yeah. everybody's always asking for seller financing. For sure. So they're kind of stuck in limbo forever. Mm-hmm. So we always make the joke that land, literally nobody buys it. We've never been bought out on a deal. We just make the offer and wait six months, 12 months, and it comes back <laughs> to us again. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think looking, my understanding, I don't do a lot of land, uh, but, you know, I'm going to be dating myself here back, you know, back in my day. When I was learning <laughs> about land, it was always 10, 10, 10, right? Mm-hmm. It was 10% down, 10% interest, and doing 10, mm-hmm. uh-huh. right? So, I mean, is that rule ever mentioned anymore or is that or is that just like the old people same thing <laughs> yeah 10 percent interest uh we do we were aiming at 11.99 when the rates went up we were at 10 mm-hmm. uh, but yeah 10 percent down and, and 10 12 percent interest works great yeah yeah, yeah. so we'll, go ahead we'll do th- up to 30 years but it really depends on what they can afford mm-hmm. we kind of may mold the payment around them gotcha who's buying your land dude it's all retail end buyers we don't have a buyer's list at all mm-hmm. zero buyer's list yeah, we just sell directly to end buyers. So we essentially have a wholesale model. So we do a lot of like guerrilla marketing through Facebook and Facebook ads mm-hmm. and then MLS and then we put pen and signs out. So we do like every type of marketing channel because that's the other thing. If, once you sit like 45 days in the MLS, you're going to start getting beat up by, <laughs> by wholesalers. By us. By us and wholesalers. By these nasty wholesalers. I know. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah. So our, our whole goal is we're trying to move that property within under 60 days. Mm-hmm. Better if that. The person, people that come in week one, those are serious buyers. So we're always trying to offload it or for those people that come in early because mm-hmm. we know how to price it. And if we're offering selling financing, hey, 10% down, I'm like, okay, yeah, how much is it per month? Mm-hmm. Oh, 2500 Okay, I got that. Don't worry about that. That's all we need to know. How much can they put down? Mm-hmm. How much can they afford months? It's almost like, and, then, and then we can back into the years and everything else. It's like, right. yeah. it's like used car sales. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like used car sales because yeah. they, the, they back into the purchase price and the I monthly mean, payment. New car sales is not that different. I mean, <laughs> same idea. It's just car sales in general. Yeah. So we're like the car sales of real estate. Yeah. So, um, so you take it down, you buy a seller finance, and then you list it on the MLS, and then retail buyer comes along and you sell it. Cash or seller finance. Yeah. In which way. way we can. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so then you guys are getting pretty comfortable with notes then, I would imagine. Absolutely. Okay. Our which note, is different note, than land. Our note game's getting pretty crazy. All right. So how, who is helping you guys? Who's helping you guys get good in notes? For one, experience. But for two, we're, we're, just, we're learning from a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, I think even the note buyers, right? Those guys are really seasoned and they're really good. So they we're, ask we're all the good questions. <laughs> so like, what would you ask again? You need what? Okay, let's write that down. Yeah, so we're learning from them. There's a guy named Jaime Farias out of Texas who taught, mm-hmm. taught us a lot about financing and interest mm-hmm. rates and how to play with the notes. An uh, uh, older gentleman named Tom Henderson is like one of the best that ever lived, like a guru type. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've been to his seminar, got his, his book, but man, we didn't realize that land, uh, I mean, notes is its own universe. 
Right. It's his own world. It's his own mm-hmm. universe. Yeah. So most of the people that, that do notes, they can't create them. So we kind of fit in between all of them because mm-hmm. we're practicing notes. We're also creating them too. Mm-hmm. So we get to play on both sides of it. Yeah, like note buyers, they, they have trouble uh, finding the notes to buy. Mm-hmm. Right? And we're mass producing them. All right. We need help. <laughs> you guys ever work with Eddie? Uh, we, we, we interviewed him one time. And I, I think he taught us just enough in that interview for mm-hmm. us to be able to run with it. I think that was a big paradigm shift for us. Well, I guess the reason yeah. I'm bringing up Eddie, Eddie Speed is that mm-hmm. he has like a marketplace. Yeah. Right. But it doesn't really. Or I guess are you guys just holding on to the notes? We're not, doing hey, not by choice. <laughs> we're, we're doing we're doing a little bit of everything right now. So right now we've been kind of arbitraging the notes. Um, we've been selling the notes. We'd like to keep them and then leverage them again. But that's a whole other strategy in itself. Mm-hmm. But we're, we're we're working our way into keeping them and mm-hmm. so what we were them. doing in the beginning as we needed capital because we did the I think this is probably the, the gravest mistake that a real estate investor can make is you do some deals, you do some flips, then you take your own capital and then you reinvest it. I think it's the worst way to get rich ever. Yeah, yeah right. Knowing what we know now. So that's what we've been doing for five years. And uh, as soon as we create the notes, we would liquidate, either mm-hmm. pay the seller off, make a little bit of profit in our pocket, roll on to the next. So we're getting to the point to where our volume's increasing so much that we're getting stuck with notes, right? Mm-hmm. The buyers, the interest rates went up, note buying game goes down. So now we're pushing $2 million worth of notes. And it wasn't our intention to hold on to them, but we have them. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like the notes are becoming a byproduct of our business model. So that's, gotcha. that's it. Both enjoyable and traumatizing at the same time. <laughs> um, how is it enjoyable? Well, we're starting to get uh, the, the cash flow, the passive cash flow mm-hmm. is starting to build up, right? All right. The golden rule for land is land doesn't cash flow. Mm-hmm. But you know, it looks like it's cash flowing on our side. Yeah. Right? And it wasn't the intention because eventually we thought we would keep them at some point, but we didn't know because the market was going to crash and no mm-hmm. buyers were going to stop buying. Mm-hmm. So, In what ways has it been a problem? Well, being able to get in and out of deals, right? So let's say the seller says, hey, I want a million dollars for this ranch. We come in, we say, hey, well, we'll give you 200000 down or 300000 down. We chop it up. Sell it. Some of it's cash. Some of it's seller finance. We take the bulk of the cash, give it to the seller, put some mm-hmm. in our pocket. Sell the rest of the notes to pay the seller off. Mm-hmm. Well, if nobody's buying notes, like, hey, Mr. Seller, we're going to be a couple hundred thousand short by our closing date. Gotcha. Right? Or at the end of the financing term. So there, you have that that portion in there. So the 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 note you have with the seller, you can't pay them back because you can't get out of your existing note. Yeah. So we have the notes, like, hey, you know, we we can get you paid out, but would you take some notes as the rest mm-hmm. of the cash instead of cash? Sometimes they say no, sometimes they say yes, but that's the challenge right now. Yes, yeah, is being able to use that same uh, strategy that we've been using for a few years. We have a cash burn problem, mm-hmm. not a cash flow, because cash burn, every time we create a note, it just absorbs equity, mm-hmm. cash that we would could use and redeploy and all that other stuff. So right. it's just cash burn. So we're always trying to redeploy and redistribute, redistribute that. Well, that, I mean, that. I, that's the problem I think kind of happens in land. Mm-hmm. Um, there were a, a, guy, a couple guys on discount lots. You guys ever interact with them? It's no. called discount lots. Mm-hmm. Never heard of. Them. Oh. Um, so that's their problem. Is like they're buying all this land and they're selling them on on terms, right? And it's the same thing. It's like the only thing that's stopping us is cash. <laughs> Absolutely right. Because like we can we can buy good land and we can cash flow, right? Uh, but there's it takes time to recuperate the out of pocket, right? So long term, mm-hmm. it's a they got a great balance sheet, mm-hmm. <laughs> but not cash. Yep. All right. I imagine that's kind of what you're talking about as well. That's exactly what we we've, we've arrived to, right? So yeah. now we came up with this crazy idea, like let's start a fund, mm-hmm. right? Because that twelve percent return is amazing, right? Mm-hmm. If somebody just parks their cash there and they can get twelve percent back, and not have to think yeah. about it. So that's that's kind of our next direction now. Is like okay, so I think we got really really good at lend. We got mm-hmm. really, really good at lead generation, right? We have an overabundance of leads. Uh, but now, like, I think, and this is what I kind of alluded to earlier, is that make, making your own cash and redeploying it mm-hmm. is, a, is not, not the best way to get rich, right? It's, uh, to, it's not. It's the best way to get cash poor. Yeah. It was actually Corey Thompson, man. He sent me a, it was one morning, he's, he texted me a video. It was Grant Cardone, which I'm not a great big fan of. Corey is. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just think he's kind of cheesy. Yeah, Corey uh, loves Grant. I don't understand that. <laughs> For someone that hates gurus. <laughs> yeah. He really loves Grant. He really so loves Grant. He he said he, temp, he texted me a link, right? And I love Corey. So I'm like, press play. I right? just woke up, and uh, it was his book, How to Get Super Rich or something like that. Uh-huh. And the only one sentence I needed out of the whole entire book is like, just find somebody who's extremely wealthy and deploy their capital. Yeah, say no more, Grant. Yeah. So I, I it kind of clicked. So that's when I told Daniel, hey, we need to change our focus now into just raising capital. Yeah, because at the end of the day, no matter what asset class you want to get into, whether mm-hmm. it's commercial or self storage or anything like that, 
if you have capital that's ready to deploy, mm -hmm. then it makes everything else easy. And right. what we've come to find out is that it's easier to borrow a million dollars than it is to borrow $10,000, mm -hmm. right? Because the person that could lend you 10 doesn't have it. But the guy that has a million is like, yeah, here it is. Pay me back when it sells. All right. Like, oh, damn. I think we're onto something. So that's Absolutely. where we're headed next. Um, so before we get into that, before we get into the fun, because I want to talk about the fun. Mm -hmm. um, talk to me about some of your biggest success stories with land. Okay. You got a couple of them. So I'm going to start off small, and I like this deal because it shows that anybody can do it. So it's kind of barrier to entry, entry, barrier to entry deals. So we had a deal come in, very brief. Um, it was worth about thirty-five dollars to $40,000. One thing that we love about land is there's no comps. Mm -hmm. Like, we're kind of shooting in the dark. Yeah. It's, it's, and that's the best part about it because there's no verifiable comps. You say that's the best part about it. That's the best. <laughs> that's the Some best. people are, would be scared to death about that. That's the best part because as long as you know you have it under, you're going to make money. You just don't know how much. All right. So as long as you buy it right. As long as you buy it right. Yeah. So we, uh, the, the deal came in through PPC, and uh, the guy wanted 15 which is already 50 cents on the dollar, and most people would jump all over that. But the thing is that we know is that there's no buyers for this. So we're like, yeah, well, let him go. We'll, we'll, um, let him season a little bit. Mm -hmm. So he comes back three months later, and he's like, I need 15 for the slot. I remember you were interested. Like, what can you do? I'm like, dude, $9,000. It was $8,000. That's it. So he's negotiating with them, $8,000. All right, I'll take it, $8,000. So we get a contract for $8,000. We immediately sold it on Facebook Marketplace for $8,000 down, 500 a month for five years. Mm -hmm. Boom, write it up, $8,000. The buyer gives us, goes straight to the seller, and now we hold the paper. Mm -hmm. Easy deal. You can find deals like that very easily on the MLS, Marketplace, market, marketing in general. So that's kind of like our bird entry deal that we always talk about because anybody can find a $40,000 lot. There's... Mm -hmm. Some down the street you can pass up, and they're everywhere. Yeah. So that's kind of the barrier to entry. And then we had a uh, you know talk about the China deal. That's, that's yeah, that's one of the first ones that I did. So yeah, um, it's like twelve thirty at night. Lord knows what I was doing awake, mm -hmm. and I saw a number coming. It said China on it. I'm like, oh, damn scammers, right? Because I had just set up my Google ads, and uh, the lady actually, actually I called the number. Nobody answered. She calls right back. I was like, what the heck? So it's a lady that she's like a school teacher mm -hmm. right in China. She's like from here. Um, and she's the one that had the property over there by Fort Worth. And she's like, I got to sell this property and all this stuff. She's like, I, I need to get 225000 for it or 250000 And I'm like, dang, I don't have that kind of money. I just started. Mm -hmm. I don't know anybody that could lend it to me. So I'm like, yeah. this is probably not a deal, whatever. So we stayed on the phone for like an hour. We're just laughing, talking, you know, just, just having fun, like just, you know, shooting, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually she says, yeah, and then the backside of the ranch backs up to uh, I-35. And I said, wait a minute, I-35, $200,000, 40 acres. I was like. It's starting to sound like a deal. It sounds like a really good deal. Where did you where did you say the property was? So I get straight to my laptop, checked it out, and I asked her. I said, "Hey, uh, uh, what do you say, what do you got to get for this thing?" And so we made an offer that night. Um, the next day, she, she calls me. She says, "I need to talk to my son and see what he says." So she calls me the next day. She says, "Yeah, we'll go ahead and take the offer." Mm -hmm. And that's that first deal where we got that big pot for eighty five. So yeah, it was just, we did a kind of novation deal. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know what to do. Right, I'm completely lost. So I called Addison Blanks, a couple of guys that that are I'm in, that are already in the game. It's like, what, what, what's the best thing to do here? And he's like, well, how much money does she need right now? I'm like, I don't know. I didn't ask. Mm -hmm. So I called her and I said, hey, look, I want to get you the money. Let's go ahead and do the deal. I was like, what do you need to put in your pocket right away, you know, mm -hmm. just to kind of get your head above water so that we can do this deal together? And I told her I was going to resell it. Mm -hmm. I said, I might split it up into a few pieces and sell it or whatever I can do here. And uh, she said, you know what? If I had $10,000 right now, you can take all the time you need with the property. Done. Called my attorney, had him draw it up. Yeah. <laughs> Send her 10 grand. She, she put it in my name. I, I, list, I listed it on the MLS and the neighbor bought it. Damn. Okay. Good yeah. to go. Yeah. So yeah. So the quick eighty five. That's not. That's not too shabby. Significant man for somebody that's just getting started. Didn't have the confidence to know what yeah. I was doing. Um. So it was, it was a really good win, man. It, it really kind of set the bar for me. It's like, hey, I thought I was gonna flip houses, right? Because mm -hmm. like I'm the best contractor that ever lived. I'm a licensed home builder, general contractor. Like, yeah. I'm just gonna kill it in remodeling, right? But uh, it just yeah. As soon as I got that pop on land, I was like, okay, mm -hmm. yeah, I need to, I need to stick with this. All right. Uh, right, we got another one. So we, this, is, this is one we did back in November. Uh, we bought 18 acres in Bastrop. And Where? I, Bastrop, Texas. <laughs> it's east of Austin. Okay. So <laughs> I like this one, too. We're kind of scaling a little bit up. We got a, we got a free, free, free cash flow deal. We got an 85 clip. This one was really good. So um, we a wholesaler bought it, and they had it, and they're kind of sitting on it, and they're trying to move it again. Mm -hmm. They're like, we, it was 18 acres. We would never bought it if it was one lot. One thing we, what we're always looking for is arbitrage opportunities. So this is 18 acres in four lots. Ding, 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 ding. Mm -hmm. That's money right there. So we bought it for $450. Uh, it was like a Wednesday or Thursday. We've been closed on it. 
we had three contracts for three of the lots because um, we sold it separately by Monday for six hundred grand. They closed in two weeks, so we were in four hundred, six hundred back, and then we still have one lot that we're still selling for one ninety nine. I think it went under contract today. Oh, I didn't even tell me. So, <laughs> yeah. so it was like four hundred in, eight hundred out, and I think it's, it's so been, it was like a two hundred and thirty k win in like three weeks from the yeah. time we closed, and uh, we had it sold before we had to close, and then uh, yeah, so that last one should be like roughly four hundred, like in sixty days or something. Yeah. So those are all some really good wins, right? Yeah. Um, the promise of the show, or the premise of the show, is why land is the best investment. Yeah. So why is land the best investment? Because depending on what your strategy is, if it's cash flow or flips, you can do bigger spreads and create larger cash flow in mm -hmm. land without any of the capex, opex, and management of mm -hmm. any other asset class. There's no staff. Nothing's going to break down. There's no roof leaks, no toilets, no tenants. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because we've had we've had Jack Bosch on the show, yeah, uh -huh. right. We've had Ray Jang uh, on the show. We had uh, Brent Bauer. Is that was was yeah, okay, yeah, Brent, yeah, yeah. right. It's because like yeah, I mean they're all preaching the same thing, right? Uh, so tenants, toilets, termites. I think that's what that's that's Jack's yeah <laughs> saying, right? You're saying no staff, which I think is also incredibly appealing. <laughs> um, so then, what are the expenses then in running? A, a, a land business. So I'll tell you, for the most part, if for a brand new land company, it would be marketing and engineering, mm -hmm. right? Or and improvements. So if you had to put in culverts, fences, that kind of stuff, um, that would probably be the biggest challenge. But just if, if I could back up for one second, I want to talk about because I didn't get to answer why uh, why land is the best investment. Mm -hmm. I think it's a it's a sure bet no matter what, right? So if you buy a commercial property, you buy a house, you buy something like that, there's always that little that buffer zone where you don't know what's going to happen, right? Uh -huh. your, your, your rehab goes up, goes over. Now it's not a deal anymore. Yeah. Interest rates turn and you got to give back $80 million worth of apartments, right? Uh -huh. We saw in Texas. <laughs> so with, yes, land, <laughs> with land, you buy 100 acres, right? We look at it through that first lens of 10 acre subdivides. So there's for sure profit there, right? We uh -huh. usually aim for somewhere between like 500 and a million per wrench. Uh, so there's going to be some kind of win, even if it halves, right? And now instead of 500, you make 250. Mm -hmm. oh, still, no. still a sure bet, right? Nobody's going to feel sorry for us if we made 250000 instead of five. Like, right. Right. But with land, you can take it to the next level always. It's always a strategy. So instead of doing 10 acre tracks, right, you do some engineering, you break mm -hmm. it down to five acre lots or two and a half acre lots or one acre lots. So mm -hmm. instead of you having to take a loss, right, with like apartments or commercial of any of those guys, you just hit it with a little bit more capital in a few more months and you can always increase the output it's no a, matter what. It's a blank canvas. Even if you yeah. overbought, even if you overpaid. You still continue to inject a little bit of time and capital into it, and you mm -hmm. can always force appreciation higher. So much so that some some of them you can push them into ten million, twenty million, right profit, mm -hmm. uh, just by continuing to inject more time and capital into it. So it's a for sure bet. You're never going to lose. And, and I say never, but I mean there's a lot of ways to in, increase the the value of that property by just mm -hmm. putting in more time and capital. Gotcha. Uh, so marketing, what kind of marketing are you guys doing to get land? This is the funny part. So we let, we talked about podcasting a little bit earlier. We have not marketed to a seller in 13 months directly. Okay. So we have zero marketing spend right now. Mm -hmm. All of our lead flow comes from our students and just education that we put out there. Mm -hmm. And like, is this a deal? And then we put a lot of full outward education. So, and like right now, we don't have that many students, but we have enough deal flow where we're, it's crazy. Yeah. So we're just looking to grow the team at this point. We have 550 ranches in our spreadsheet and it grows every day. Mm -hmm. Every day. Yeah. So you say ranch, just. I'm I'm curious if maybe that means different things in different areas. <laughs> so what does ranch mean when you say ranch? You know, maybe somebody's going to ding me. They're going to watch this and be like, no, he blew it because I'm from Texas, right? But I'm, I'm a city boy. I'm not even from the country. So The hat is just for show? Yeah. <laughs> Branding purposes only. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, so a ranch is usually like a workable ranch, right? So you're going to have like animals. You're going to have equipment. You're going to have maybe uh, uh, irrigation, stuff like that, mm -hmm. uh, where... In another type of property, you might say a farm, right? Where it's only raising animals. Yeah, because in my head, you say that. I'm thinking farmland. <laughs> we, we, we've gotten cows. Yeah. We've gotten cows. Free cows. If Com you buy enough land, you get, with the property. You, you get free houses. Yeah. So, like, pe we always make a joke about, like, oh, why would you buy a house if you get it for free if you buy enough land? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, do, what are, what's the definition textbook? I mm -hmm. don't know. Yeah. But yeah, in my mind, farms, it's like more like agricultural based, like animals, raising animals, cows, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I think a ranch is, is, is a kind of production. So there might be a little bit of everything. There might be animals. There might be uh, some growing going on there. Gotcha. That kind of stuff. But in my mind, I'm just imagining it's a, it's a big giant tract mm -hmm. of land that nobody's using outside of the city. Right. Okay. But there's got to be some parameters as well. Right. 
Like, uh, what's the minimum size? Right now, we're looking. We've done smaller stuff, but we're looking for twenty acres or more, mm -hmm. just because if it's a ten acre rule, we can at least cut that into two lots mm -hmm. minimum. Mentally, I'm looking for. I'm thinking about hundred acres and up. So recently, yeah. I, I, I we checked on MLS, and uh, we, that's what that was the first search. We did hundred acres and up, and mm -hmm. the cool thing about land is the bigger the property is, the easier it gets. Right? You need that initial cash injection. You need mm -hmm. that earnest money or uh, the option money, the engineering money. Yeah. But a bigger ranch has a lot more profit involved, right? So if you bought a 20-acre lot, you can easily split that into 10 and 10. You're done in two or three months. It's mm -hmm. a done deal. Right. But, you know, again, the profit's kind of like you, you, if you're going to put in 10, 20, 30,000 and you only pull out 50. But if you buy a 243-acre ranch and you extract a million dollars in, in four mm -hmm. weeks or something, yeah. right? So the, the bigger the properties, the, the more leverage it's in there. So in some cases... We contract the property, we do our magic on it, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we sell a, a small portion of the property and pay it off. And the right. rest is ours, free and clear. What states are you guys buying in? Uh, mostly Texas. We're looking at other states. We've done some deals in Florida. But Texas is just, there's so much opportunity there. Mm -hmm. We're just looking anywhere in Texas. Gotcha. Um, and then there's got to be some sort of like, has to be a certain distance from town or something. Yeah, so right. you're not doing it like a hundred hundred miles out of town. So this, this is where we differentiate from a lot of other land people is that they like they like the desert squares. You can get a lot for five hundred bucks with eighty eighty seven dollars down. I'm like, yeah, you could do that, and I think if you start there, that's perfectly fine. But I like buying land where people want to be mm -hmm. because I can I can charge more for it. I can get a really great opportunity for it, mm -hmm. and I can move it faster if I buy it where people want to be. So usually we like being within. You think of like the city as a donut. If you think of Austin. Cut out Austin and then go around Austin, and that's our buffer zone. So mm -hmm. we're usually within 45 minutes to an hour of any major city, and that's where all the money's being made right now. So are you at a point where, like, city lights are still there? Or no. we're past city lights? In some we're, cases, no. <laughs> we're, we're past city lights. Okay. Yeah, so think about, I, I'm thinking in my mind, like a good 10 to 20 miles out is amazing because mm -hmm. that's an easy commute back and forth. Yep. Right. 30 minutes is still good. 45 minutes, you're getting questionable. Mm -hmm. I think the cutoff mark is about 60 miles. Once, once you're an hour out, yeah, you're, you're kind of like in no man's land. 61 miles, you're done. Right. So, yeah, I would say 30 minutes or under, 10 minutes better. You know, so that's what we're looking for. Like the 243 we bought, mm -hmm. it's like 10 miles right outside Loop 1604 in San Antonio. So, I see. in my mind, that's still the city, even though there's no, you know, lights out there. So, for you, it's that you, you really can't lose because you can always force appreciation. No land. matter what, yeah. And for you, you can basically act like a wholesaler and flipper without the stress of actually dealing with the property. Absolutely. Gotcha. Um, if it's so easy, why isn't everyone doing it? Not enough information is I think is my my point. Okay. There's not enough people information and we've had to we've had to block people to like, hey, you're teaching too much about land. Like this is a what people? You you get to a point to where that these deals are so profitable mm -hmm. that people get mad when you're when you're giving out public information, mm -hmm. like saying like teaching on YouTube, like hey, mm -hmm. you know, this is how you do land. People are like, dude, that's like our best kept secret for the last hundred years, and you guys are blowing it for us. Gotcha. So for one, people keep the information close to the chest. Mm -hmm. um, there is a, a capital barrier to entry, right? Yeah. So sometimes these these ranchers or farmers or whatever they want like fifty thousand earnest money, hundred thousand of earnest money. It's not a joke, right? You can't put mm -hmm. down a hundred bucks on some of this stuff, and you can because we've done it. Right. But it's not as simple. It's not the norm. Yeah. Then you get it under contract. Now what the heck do I do? So average wholesaler goes out, they get it under contract, and, and then they start blasting it out trying to sell the whole 200-acre track. Mm -hmm. And we get an inbox. They want $7.4 million. Has to close in two weeks. Like, sure, guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ain't going to happen. So you, you have to know who who is your buyer, right? You have to have the capital in place to be able to put the earnest money down. Mm -hmm. uh, a ranch that we're doing entitlements on right now, we're aiming for like 500000 in entitlements. Mm -hmm. So you do have to have some capital to play. And right. that's where, you know, we come in with our students as we say, hey, look, if you guys find the deal, we'll negotiate it, close it, contract it, we'll put up the capital. Mm -hmm. Got it. So you're basically the OPM. Yeah. For your students. Yeah. Okay. So then how does that work? You're using other, you're, you're. We're lender. using the OPM, but we're operating as a lender. So you're, you are taking capital from elsewhere mm -hmm. and then you're the bank here. So kind of like not quite private money it's not quite hard money but it's some sort of hybrid well it's private because we don't we don't run anything on anybody so mm -hmm. if a student brings a deal we don't care what their financials look like or the credit or anything we right. underwrite the deal right and that's it so we but say, it's not your money yeah <laughs> we, had to, we had to grab it from somewhere else and that's still private too yeah right? yeah so we'll have guys just shoot us over the cash and say hey mm -hmm. you guys want to get on this we need 550 let's do it send it gotcha. over done they're not underwriting the deals either well, they're they, just going based on our reputation no, it's their money they're they're just trusting in you so that's it 
what are you guys typically borrowing at uh, from your lenders? The, the percentage? Uh, the rate. The rate? Oh, dude. <laughs> this is the best part. Um, we pay, we've been paying our lenders like 50 to 100%. Mm-hmm. Wow. Whatever they want is the answer. Whatever wow. they want. Whatever they want. And like, the thing is, is like, the best way to get more private capital is to overpay <laughs> for private capital and they open up their wallet. Yeah. So we've been overpaying since we started. And that's how we're able to get millions now mm-hmm. at our fingertips because we're overpaying our capital. Yeah. So um, it's it's a long term play because everybody struggles. Like if you had unlimited wallet, what would you buy? I'm like mm. whatever I wanted, you know. So if you can get good capital at good opportunities, and we're creating such large spreads, I'm like, hey, I can share this ROI with the lender mm-hmm. because it's not my money. If I can make half a million dollars with your money, like hey, how much how much ROI do you want? You know, right. it's a different it's a different conversation where. A house or apartment, like it's limited capital. Like if I give too much equity to the to the lender, it ruins my cap rate. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> so, you know. But you say uh, fifty to hundred percent. Like I give you hundred grand, you're gonna give me two hundred grand. Is that what we're talking about? Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes. No problem. And sometimes yeah. more. Sometimes yeah. over hundred percent. It just really depends on the deal. But that can't be sustainable over a long period of time. Uh, well, the, the thing is, is that if the deal flow keeps coming in, like mm-hmm. like right now, I think we, we measured our pipelines over 100 million right now. Gotcha. So every time we do a deal, if we're looking at making a million or two million or four million, mm-hmm. and the lender's like, hey, I'll put in an M, but I want two back, like pencil it out, it works fantastic. Mm-hmm. So, so the only thing, play. <laughs> it still works out. So I think that's why like right now, we're focusing on, on the, the capital raising part because- Are you at times giving them more profit than you? Is, are they walking with more than you no, are? No, I think I think the the, the highest we, we we did that at the beginning because we would like lock in rates, mm-hmm. but now we're getting like okay, we had a deal we're gonna make a hundred on it, so we're like yeah, oh, we'll give you we'll give you fifty grand back, and we ended up getting a haircut on it, and we ended up making like thirty grand, and mm-hmm. the lender made thirty grand, so like it was I mean it was still yeah. a deal. I think yeah. right now we're maxing out like at about fifty percent profit. Yeah, you guys yeah. put up the cash, we'll put the intellectual capital and we'll split it. Mm-hmm. That will stop there. But there's no way we're going to go in there and, and make 300 and the lender makes a million. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll stop at 50-50. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. And, and that makes total sense to me. Okay. So um, how are you guys? So you guys aren't spending money on pay-per-click right now or anything. So Zero. if someone wanted to go get land right now, what are you telling people how to market to get land? Tell them, Daniel. Tell them. Just tell them. Uh, go to Zillow.com and find stuff that's listed and make offers. Dude, you yeah. can go shopping on the MLS, bro. That 200, yeah. the 200 acres, we picked up 30 cents in the dollar on the MLS for six months. Mm-hmm. Just shooting, chilling. Shooting fish in the barrel, bro. Nobody's yeah. playing. Nobody's playing the game. I, I, I pulled a list just in the San Antonio area of ranches that are 100 acres and up. Mm-hmm. 82 listings. So the, the, thing is, <laughs> the thing is is that most people in the land space, they usually deal 100000 or less. The higher in price point, just like houses, there's less, there's less players that operate at that at that price point. Mm-hmm. So what we're learning is that the more we go up in price, the less people are playing at that level. So every all the people on the MLS, like we need motivated sellers. Land sellers are not motivated. They've been sitting on that land for 50 years. Mm-hmm. So what's the what's the what's the high max motivation of that? It's on the MLS. They already raised their hand. They signed a contract with an agent. Mm-hmm. They're motivated right, right now to sell. So. We just count that as like, hey, that's motivation enough for us, mm-hmm. and it's just time. So we make the offer, we wait, they come back six months, twelve months later. We had a deal. Uh, the lady wanted one point three for a property. We made our offer, nothing. We came back fourteen months later. We bought it for three fifty. Mm-hmm. Three fifty, and she probably got beat up by wholesalers in the midst of all that. Locked up her property for six months, yeah. all that stuff. So that people time wears them down, mm-hmm. where they come to their senses and like, hey. Dan and Anthony, they made, a, they made a sensible offer. Let me go back and see if they'll give it to me again. So you guys come in, if, I'm, if my math is correct, about 25%. Yeah. Right. Well, so I mean, it's different for every property because mm-hmm. we're underwriting it based off of what it actually is worth. Because some of these sellers are like, oh, I want, there's a, and this is, this is for everybody here. It's like five acres sold for 50,000 an acre. So I want 50,000 an acre for my 500 acre ranch. I'm like, it doesn't work <laughs> like that. It doesn't math out like that. It doesn't math out like that. So the bigger the property the less price breaker you get for it, and mm-hmm. it goes, the price breaker goes small, goes larger, uh, smaller the track. Right. Hence, you can get an That's acre. why your model works. That's why it works. It's the wholesale model with mm-hmm. Costco. You buy in bulk and you sell it by the, by the whatever. However you want I to think it. something that works in our favor is there's no true measuring stick for the comps. Mm-hmm. There's no comps. Right. So uh, a lot of times, probably 20 or more times, agents have told us, like, you're never going to sell it for that. Nothing's ever sold for that in that area. And mm-hmm. we immediately create new comps. 
All right. Yeah. So oh. uh, I think that's that's something that's cool that works. So you say like, do we buy at twenty five cents? Well, twenty five cents of what? Right. Twenty five percent of the listed price. Right. Because the agent came in and told them that it was worth three x of what they were told. You know that mm-hmm. they could get for it. When in reality, you know, the way we break it down is what would a ten acre track sell for? Mm-hmm. So if they had a hundred acre track or a two hundred acre track, we don't care about any of that. What can I sell ten acres for? And then mm-hmm. we back into the deal that way. Gotcha. And so we're not necessarily looking at comps like to say, hey, well, to two hundred acre track sold for twenty million. Mm-hmm. So that's what we're going to buy it for. Like it doesn't even yeah, that is even, based off your exit strategy. We're just yeah. looking at that that one lens, and then like comps kind of count, but they kind of don't, mm-hmm. right? And I'll tell you why. So let's say that everything around there is selling for 150 an acre, but we know damn well that it's close enough to the city that we can easily get 199. Mm-hmm. We're just going to roll with what we think we can get for it, All and right. and kind of that's like our our magic exit is at 150 to like 250 mm-hmm. for a 10 acre track. So as long as we can hit that demographic, then we're done, especially seller finance, mm-hmm. right? Because these guys can't go to the bank or the credit union and get seller financing. Uh, so if we say, hey, look, everything around there is selling for 150 to 179, we don't care. We're still going to push it out at 250 with 10% down. And mm-hmm. I, know we, I know we can get it every single time because they yeah. only need 25 grand to buy. Gotcha. So you came out uh, to my training. Mm. And I'm kind of heartbroken right now. It sounds like you didn't even use it. It sounds like you just did everything by email. <laughs> <laughs> he used all the same closes, but he just typed them out instead of saying them. Yeah. <laughs> I really did. That's that's a hundred percent fact. I used your sales script and I was typing it out hundred percent. So, <laughs> so you never used the, the 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 lines on actual homeowners? No, I never. I never did because I used it. I used it through email, and then after I met him, he was doing all the sales calls. I'm mm-hmm. like, I'm like, Anthony, <laughs> you're up. Yeah. You know. And I, I didn't have to practice with it, so gotcha. And it was one of those things where I was I, I gave him the I gave him the script, and then he mm-hmm. was like, "Oh, I use a version of this." Mm-hmm. So he like modified and created his own little version of it because right. he's already a sales guy. Yeah. So it was just like, it was, it was no offense to you. <laughs> I'm not offended. I'm just heartbroken. Right. <laughs> you spent heartbroken. hard. You spent hard on hard earned money on it, right? I did. I did. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. I mean, I still remember the sales call. As a matter of fact, it might be recorded. It might be on my Dropbox if I wanted to. Uh, to pull it up. So, uh, all right. So then, the next thing you're talking about is then raising capital. Mm-hmm. So, what is the vision for raising capital? Um, I think the vision right now is where we, when you get to larger amounts of capital, you have to create the right vehicle for people to invest in. Mm-hmm. They're not going to invest in uh, Steve Trang LLC just because it's not an offense to you, but you don't have the right vehicle to receive and uh, oversight. So what's the next step is a fund. So a mm-hmm. fund is SEC regulated. You have certain rules and parameters you have to mm-hmm. fall under. And then people with higher net worths are willing to put capital into that structure mm-hmm. because it, it feels safer. Not that it is your own due diligence, but um, it feels safer because it's regulated. Because it's right, yeah. And the, the flip side of this is you can do a fund for any type of model you want, including up to losing $80 million of apartments. <laughs> no one, we're not attacking anyone here. <laughs> We're not talking about anyone here. If you felt offended, it's because it was meant for you. Yeah. No names. Right. But it's one of those things where like you can, and a lot of people that run the fund model, they get paid to acquire. They get paid to dispose. They get paid for management. And like our whole fund is like, I don't really care about any of those things. We're, we're running the fund at cost. We'll pay out of our own pocket. I just need money to invest because every time we create a note and sell it, we're giving an ROI to that lender. If I can sell my note to the fund, I can give the ROI to somebody I know and trust and mm-hmm. like versus giving it to somebody I don't know and like and trust. Right. So if I can wash my left hand with my right, I'd rather do that and create the right fund structure. Mm-hmm. That way I can keep doing the, the transaction I want and fill that cash burn problem. Right. So I think the, the vision for the fund is, uh, of course, we need the initial capital right, for the earnest money, the surveys, the engineering, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. We're going to take that ranch and we're going to property farm whatever you want to do right somebody's like this one's not a ranch it's a farm uh we're going to take that property and we're going to convert it into both notes and cash Uh right and again like if the market gets weak then the note game gets soft and you can't get rid of the notes Uh so the idea of having the capital in place is that we can redeploy the same capital over and over and over again Uh right so uh lenders put in 100 million right we're going to do we're going to raise 100 million for our first raise a full rounds of 25 million Uh we have one soft commitment for 20 already Nice. Right. So people kind of see the vision of what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, we want to have the capital in place so that if we do get to a point to where the ranch is sold out and we have a stack of notes, we can sell them to ourselves effectively. Mm-hmm. Right. And then redeploy that capital again. So use that cash flow to pay back the lenders that put there in if they're getting a 18% profit. Create distributions as well. Mm-hmm. Whatever it is, that, that 
capital that's sitting there at 12% interest can go right back to the investors, right? right? Because that thing's recycling every month. It reloads and keeps paying those people down without us having to pull from our capital pool. Mm-hmm. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to continue to take that capital and just recycle it into new deals, use the notes to pay down the investors over the time. Gotcha. So uh, the notes you've created uh, to sell, or the notes you've created yeah, to sell the land that you've subdivided, right, to the, to the end buyers, you're taking those notes and you're selling those notes to the fund? Yep. That's the intention. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. So it's, um, are you selling the notes to the fund? And this might be too technical here. Let's but, go. Let's go deep. But like, at what <laughs> value are you selling the notes? So we would like to sell them at like 80% of the value because mm-hmm. even like that, it creates like a 15% yield. Mm-hmm. And then if the seller pays back early, it actually increases the yield. Mm-hmm. which mostly we have sellers that pay back early. So our target for the fund is we're definitely in no guarantees. But <laughs> there, there's, I got to be careful here. Yeah, <laughs> you do have to be careful with this stuff. It's true. No, yeah. this is this one of the way to go to prison. It's yeah. Pretty, yeah. So like we're, we're offering a 12% preferred return because we know we can, we're creating 12% notes. Uh-huh. So if we sell them discounted, we're going to create higher yield at that point. Uh-huh. And then um, if the note pay, ever pays back earlier, if we have to restructure the loan as the, the note just because and that's the other thing too. There's three things you can do whenever a note comes due. You restructure, or you restructure like you did in COVID. You foreclose like they did in 2008. Or what investors do is they do cash for keys mm-hmm. and resell it again. Right. So we have those options and availability without actually selling that note to John Smith over here, who's just going to do that by himself. Mm-hmm. We actually hold it within the fund structure and have the ability to recycle and re- re- recapture that note if it ever comes defaulted. Uh, so before my next question. Uh, for those that are listening, what is a pref return? Because we're using some fancy terms here. Yeah. A, a pref return is essentially a not guaranteed rate of return, preferred. but it's a preferred return <laughs> that your fund is offering in your PPM mm-hmm. to your investors that invest into your fund. So right. what effectively what we're saying is if you give us $10 million, we would like to give you back 12%. That's our target. Right. Um, that's what the preferred rate of return. Mm-hmm. And this is secured by real estate, 80% loan to value in good assets that we can always restructure and repurpose. Gotcha. Uh, 12% sounds really high. And I understand yeah. that your notes are 12%. But just because your notes are 12%, why would you offer a preferred return? Because you, don't, you, you can pay more. Absolutely. So why would you? Because a preface, it's not a guarantee, but it feels like a guarantee. <laughs> yeah. right so why would you offer a number that's higher and make you like, wouldn't it be better to potentially under promise and over deliver versus setting a high expectation well it's 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 a it's a juggling act you gotta you gotta kind of do whatever it is but my whole thing is that a lot of larger capitals are looking for good and safe investments mm-hmm. so we want to make sure they get a good safe investment with a high rate of return mm-hmm. because we're creating notes at 12 percent, so 12 percent is in well i'm not saying don't give a good return no, I'm saying you're saying how can you guarantee that much? Yeah, no. right. Like it's it's um because yes, you can hit it right. It's that whole deal of under promise and over deliver versus yeah. like setting really high expectations and then the one time you don't hit it, now everyone's upset. Yeah. So here's here's the other thing too. So all the assets we're buying are usually fifty percent loan to value. Mm-hmm. So if we were to hold and create these notes ourselves, we'd be getting a like fifty to sixty percent uh, ROI on our capital for thirty years. Yeah. So giving an 18% return is very minimal mm-hmm. for that fund structure. So it's really easy. I mean, we, we talk about we're paying our lenders right now 50 yeah. to 100%. Yeah. That, 18%. That is, one I can't pencil out. We're going to have to we're gonna have to sit down with a spreadsheet with that one. 18, that one's not making sense in my head. 18%. I, it's not, and it's not that I don't believe you. I just can't get it around my head. 18% is it's, it's easy mm-hmm. for what we do because I can buy a $100,000 lot um, – I can buy a hundred thousand dollar lot for eighty grand and provide a fifteen percent return, mm-hmm. just Big, like that instantly. The, the target of our average deal on these bigger ranches is at least fifty to one hundred percent minimum, mm-hmm. right? That's not even including on the back end. But this isn't the ten percent we're looking for in flips. No, oh, no, no, no. Yeah. This is a totally yeah, different if model. Buy for, if we if we spend a million in cash, we want to pull two out of the deal, mm-hmm. right? Typically, it's not our cash, right? So it's dead eights, infinite returns, twelve percent for the notes alone, mm-hmm. and then that's not even including partials. That's not even including us taking it to the next level through the entitlement process. Yeah. So where uh, if we get a, a ranch with five or ten percent down, we're a hundred thousand into the deal, and mm-hmm. we pull out a million in cash at the end of it. 
in 12 to 24 months. So it makes 12 like insignificant. Like if somebody said, hey, I'll lend you $100 million at 12%, like can I get two? Right. <laughs> they had such a, such a low target for us. Mm -hmm. Even if we took zero and just paid the 12, it's still fine. Yeah. It's just one deal, right? When you have, when you have an infinite lead flow. So I think that's something that makes us a little bit dangerous mm -hmm. is that we, uh, if you, you can't go out and raise $100 million if you have a $10 million pipeline, mm -hmm. right? You might, right. you might find yourself upside down pretty quick. Yeah. But we have our, our lead flow is so tremendous that we could replace a loss, no problem. Right? Mm -hmm. you, 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 let's say we, we don't hit a target on a, on a deal and we, we only make 11%, right? We're 1% short now. But on the next one, we do 5X, right? right. Real easy to soften up that one point. Mm -hmm. um, you said you got a soft commit from 20 mil for 20 mil. Mm -hmm. From one person. How did yeah. you get a soft commit for that? Is there someone that you already have a working relationship with? Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Somebody that came from inside of our community. Okay. How did you get that? So you said within the community. Mm -hmm. Was this an investor in the community, the student in the community, or a referral from a student inside your community? It's actually, yeah, it was a referral from somebody inside the community. It was gotcha. a family member. Gotcha. Yep. And he said, hey, this guy has some money to spend. He wants to talk to you guys. And mm -hmm. it started out small. I think the first time they went in with us was 200000 mm -hmm. uh, We paid them back 100000 in under 12 months. Mm -hmm. And uh, they thought that was the amazing. 200 turned to 300 Yeah. Gotcha. In under 12 months. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people would be happy with that return. Yeah. And, and, and then the other thing, too, is like we, we like try and like get long term guidelines, but if we complete it faster, say so we did that in six months, that's 100% annualized return. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing we do with our lenders uh, before the fund, right? This fund has not launched yet, uh, but it, we uh, pay them the same rate of return no matter when it closes. Mm -hmm. So if we take cash and we finish the deal in 30 days or 60 days or 90 days, they get a flat rate. Right. So they said, hey, yeah, we'll park it with you guys for a year or two years. But if the deal's over in three or four months, they get all their money back right away. Mm -hmm. And then so, what happens is they get really excited and they're ready they to go happy? again. And then they call their friends and their friends and their friends. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, you know, we have the capital is kind of starting to stack up now. People are starting to call us and say, hey, can you guys use 400? Hey, can you use 800? Hey, mm -hmm. can you guys use 200? And we're like, yes, but hang on. <laughs> right. Right. So we make sure that our, us, like if we bought a B deal or a B plus deal, amazing. One of the best deals we've ever done in our life. Mm -hmm. But for our investors, we look for like A and A plus deals. Like we got to stop buying A deals. It's all, let's do all A plus now. Mm -hmm. So we're extra careful with other people's capital, you know, more so than what we would be with our own. Gotcha. Um, so you guys also have a CRM. Yeah. Right, I'm seeing this <laughs> on your shirt. It's not in the talking points here, but clearly you guys have the CRM. So talk to me, you guys, um, somewhere along the lines, somewhere along the line, started a CRM. And started a podcast, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we're, we've only been talking about land this whole time. Yeah, right. So, like, what are what is your guys' core focus? I'll take it first. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. So, um, having a, a a marketing and an MLM background, uh, it kind of gave me the vision for uh, what what you can do in numbers and, and volume. Right. Mm -hmm. So when I started trying to when I started deciding I was going to focus on land. I noticed that these big deals with these big spreads are tough to find. I'm not going to mm -hmm. lie, right? Especially when you're not going straight to the MLS like we are now. Right. So I had a vision is um, what if we created a mastermind where we just taught people how to go out and find these big deals, mm -hmm. right? Because they were so hard to find. So what do we do? You know, other people's money, other people's time, mm -hmm. right? To be able to scale this thing. So that was the vision. Like what if we could teach a community of people how to go out and find these deals, bring them to us, and then we'll do the experting on the background, raise the mm -hmm. capital, and close them. So. The mastermind was the first vision, but I said, if somebody joins a mastermind on Monday, you know, 30 days later, they're out, right? Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. I'm out of here. So I thought, you know, what would be a sticky product to keep them here? So all we did was just white label GHL. Mm -hmm. You know, we came up with the idea in December. We launched February 1 or something, mm -hmm. you know, February 2. So like, it was like under a six-week launch. Right. Because we didn't want to be known for our CRM and having the best CRM in the world. Mm -hmm. We just needed somebody to download a bunch of data, mm -hmm. right? Put a bunch of information in here, start to use the product mm -hmm. and market. So it would be a little stickier than just picking up all of your toys and going home after right. being in for 30 days. Yeah. So that's all it was. It was a way for us to create a mastermind with a very sticky product so mm -hmm. that it's not so easy to leave. And of course, the brand's more recognizable than being Daniel Martinez, mm -hmm. you know, LLC. They'd rather be yeah. in, in, in something that has a name and a tag on it. So it was, that's all it was. It's kind of just a faux product mm -hmm. for us to build a brand and build a name yeah. for ourselves. Well, and it's worked, right? Uh, and it's, it's a brilliant idea because I'm actually copying that same exact idea. Sick, okay. Right? It's, uh, you know, we have our sales community. Mm -hmm. You know, it's for 97 a month. But community is not sticky. Mm -hmm. But if they buy a sell CRM for 97 bucks a month, that also includes sales training, they'll stick around forever. Yeah. Or at least that's the hope. Yeah. Right? It works. Yeah. Well, clearly. 
right? <laughs> I mean, this is something that, uh, let's see. Uh, I mean, Russell Brunson, right? He's the one that's got the linchpin deal. I don't, I don't know. Do you pay attention to him? I, I know I know of him. I just don't know what he offers or what yeah. he does. I well, his finals, whole thing is, yeah. is is all about spending as much money to get someone into a product that they'll never use, right? Mm -hmm. But education is a product people will leave all day. Yeah. yeah. Right? So how do you get in the stick? That yeah. was it. That was the only idea, man. Yeah. I thought we were going to build something from the ground up. And mm -hmm. then Daniel finds GHL. He's like, dude, just, let's, let's just use this. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, instead of pushing back, like, I'm the visionary. We got to do it my way. I'm like, dude. We can, how long would it take us to set this up? He's like, we can be up and running in four weeks. Yeah. Do it. Which I think is much shorter today. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's a lot shorter today, for sure. Yeah, now, now we can put <laughs> stuff up in a day or two, right? Yeah. yeah. So and our, our whole thing, and I think you kind of mentioned it a little bit, is our entry into the marketplace. Everybody, everybody wants to be influential in the real estate community, but like, yeah. there's, a lot, there's a lot of different ways you could do it. So you have coaching, which it's very clogged because everybody wants to be a coach. Mm -hmm. So then you coach after to, you do one deal. I, I, yeah. After you want to be a coach after you do your first deal. So then yeah. like there's 10,000 people trying to go up the coaching route. Mm -hmm. And then you got the book and everybody's like, oh, I'm going to write a book and mm -hmm. I'm going to be influential that way. Right. And then they're speaking and mm -hmm. uh, events, which people go up that way. And then they're mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah. There's like everybody going up the coaching and the event speaking around. Mm -hmm. Like if I can speak at every event, I'll I'll pay you, whatever. Mm -hmm. like, pay to get on. And then like there's people products. Pay to get on to speak. Oh yeah, come yeah, on! Yeah. <laughs> you didn't know that? I didn't know that, dude. Yeah. That's a whole thing. Yeah, you don't even no. have to be famous. You just drop some snacks and you're on stage. See, that's crazy, right? Because like I'm at a point now where they're like, "Hey, you want to speak?" It's like, "You want to pay me?" And they're like, "No." So like, oh, okay, I'm not going. <laughs> I'm not we got going. one of those from Houston. They're like, "Hey, we want you guys to come speak." Okay, awesome. Sounds good. Let us know when. Okay, it's five grand. We're like, we ain't going. You need to give us five grand to go. And I still might not go. Exactly. Yeah. So, so <laughs> people pay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> it's it's a tough world out there. I had no idea. So like, and the, our, the, our thing is so they're like, doing me a favor by letting me speak for free. Yes, yeah, lucky you. <laughs> yes, and like I said, even 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 for us, like we're getting content out. We'll pay a videographer. We'll get an Airbnb. We're gonna drop some money while we're there. So I'm not paying to show up at your event. I'm right. sorry, like, I'm just not doing it. And then not, not to toot our own horn or nothing, but I think we're doing pretty good. Yeah, you know I'm saying so. I'm like, well, it sounds like you guys are doing great. Yeah, I say, if we go on your stage, like I think we're gonna bring some information that people have never heard before. Mm -hmm. It's a unique strategy. Yeah, um, it's something again that people keep very, very private. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you invite us to speak, like, I think we're we're blessing the community, right? Right. So we're not going to also pay, like, yeah, yeah. Even if you offered us cash, like, mm, I still don't want to be away from my wife and kids. I'd rather just stay home. Well, yeah, yeah. and that's that's the challenge, right? It's like what I'm asking for, and no one will agree to. Uh, so, <laughs> so, okay, so you were saying, so speaking, uh, podcasting mm -hmm. is another route, and right. then products or services. Mm -hmm. So I think pro podcasting and products or services are like the least. Path, at least path of resistance. Mm -hmm. So we went through, we started Hive Mind. We just hit three years old, February 2021. So we're three years now. Congratulations. It was through, the, you, it was through that. And then we did that for nine months. I started the podcast uh, nine months later, 2021. Mm -hmm. And I just went hard on it. I mean, I was doing like five, 10 episodes a week for a long time. And mm -hmm. I would release five a week for a very long time. So we're like 476 episodes right Nuts. now. Yeah. 300 hours of content. I keep KPIs now. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, 300 hours of content, which is like 12 days. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, so we got the podcast. We got the product services. Now we're speaking. Mm -hmm. And then we're working on a book. We, we, we want to release a book. So it's like you kind of come through different ways, but you got to figure out what that first way is that you're going to enter the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So like HiveMind CRM is kind of like our brand, but HiveMind is our brand that we're kind of following into because we don't want to do this forever. I don't want to be that dude that has to show up at every event and like mm -hmm. I'm good. Like if I can create a, a brand that enters into the marketplace and I can put somebody else to run it mm -hmm. eventually, then that's the that's all in our goal. I'll tell you something embarrassing. <laughs> we launched the coaching program mm -hmm. and uh, the minimum was twenty five thousand, the middle one was fifty thousand, and the top was a hundred thousand. And we got what was, a the, what was the lowest one? Twenty five thousand. Twenty five, fifty, one hundred. So now okay. that we got students, we don't want to coach anymore. <laughs> yeah. We don't want people to just be randomly calling our phones mm -hmm. and, and and blowing us up. So like, dude, if we get another twenty students, I'm quitting, mm -hmm. right? So we prefer the the method of of do a community, mm -hmm. let everybody in the in the group learn, and then they can just bring us the deals as they come in, submit them through the portal. Mm -hmm. But that one on one coaching stuff, like, yeah, we're done with it at any price tag. Yeah, yeah. One -on -one we just rather just tough. do deals. One on one coaching is really tough. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> so like, it, it it's been it's been an interesting. We've been kind of diving down different things, but I think I think our model. It's it's gonna be interesting because land is a harder barrier to entry because of all the other problems you come into. And once we solve that money problem on the front end, we can be their lead source to lead contract to lead cash to cash infusion mm -hmm. to buy and take down the deal 
to lead dis- lead disposition and all the way to the end, even to the note side on right. the back end. So we, we can, we can, I, I handed one of my students who was struggling a little bit. I'm like, hey, here's a deal. You're going to make money on it if you do ABC. So he went through the whole process and he's like, oh, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50 the deal with you. We're like, okay, that's amazing. I'm not doing anything with that transaction. Mm-hmm. You go do it. We'll put up half the money. We'll put up all that stuff. But now he's doing the a- transaction A to Z and I'm not even participating into it. He had a deal where uh, one of our students found a lead. Um, he had a buyer in that area that buys and we gave him the lead. He's going to send us some money for that deal that we mm-hmm. didn't participate in. All right. So I think like in the spirit of multi-level marketing and network marketing, it's like we just need the people, right? They're mm-hmm. the distribution channel. Yeah. They're the distribution channel so, for everything. Yeah, I think I think focusing on uh, teaching people the game, let mm-hmm. them go out and pick up the deals. And also, right. also they're doing the work, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Because like having to go through the sales process of selling like 10 or 20 parcels, talking to engineers and visiting the site, those kinds of things, there's a lot of moving parts. Yeah. So like how could we scale this thing? For one, the capital, right? So the fun, most important part mm-hmm. um, so that we can bankroll the people that are out there doing the deals. What does that lead to? That leads to our students bringing in us a deal saying, hey, I need to borrow $2 million. Um, okay, cool. We'll put up the capital, but now we don't have to participate in the deal at all. Mm-hmm. Right? So we'll lend you the capital at a, at a very high rate, some kind of partnership or something. Um, and then on the back end, we could even be the note buyer. Right? right. So uh, the, we're, we're doing deals now we're passively mm-hmm. where the students are out there doing everything and we're not doing anything, just putting the capital. And there's no overhead from employees, which is the best part. How is there no overhead? Because we're not... We're not paying till they produce, just like a salesperson. Yeah. So who is analyzing the deal? So we analyze the deal because essentially we're the one bringing the capital. Mm-hmm. So we'll help analyze and negotiate up front. And they're just bringing in the extra capital. And we have so- a team. We have about five people that are there with us that are still underwriting. Mm-hmm. They've, they've been around us enough to know what we're looking for. So they'll take a look, first look at it, make sure it's something that we're interested in mm-hmm. or that we think they think we might be interested in. And then they'll send it to one of us for the final blessing. So yeah. we had an event in uh, October. We do an event every year. Uh, one of the speakers, he's not real estate based. Uh, Daniel Burke Aguero told me to give him a shout out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so he was not real estate based. He's kind of like on the coaching side of helping people kind of get their mindset and mm-hmm. their their personal side in order to get their business in order. So no real estate experience. He came, spoke at our event from a referral from somebody in our community. And um, he's like, can I try this? He has to teach me. I'm like, yeah, I mean, here's what we do, how we do it. And he just went running feet first, kind of figured it out. Mm-hmm. He, we found, he found a deal in 31 days. He cold called for like 20, 30 hours, just cold calling agents, mm-hmm. just exactly what we talked about. He found that deal we bought in January for 243 acres. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're paying him like 100 grand for his month of work yeah. that he found to find that deal. And it's just amazing. Like I've never had somebody like go from zero to 100 so fast. And now he's like, I think I got three more deals. Based off of your underwriting parameters, I think they're going to fit the box where you're going to fund it. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're going to look at it when we get back home. It's that each one teach one model. Yeah. Right? So once somebody learns it, then they can teach their peer group, two, three, four people. Mm-hmm. So that's why it has kind of like that MLM structure. Oh, it definitely yeah. has an MLM so structure. Eventually, maybe we'll have 10,000 yeah. people out there doing deals for us, and we're just providing the capital. So yeah. we, we have, we have a, Anthony's a visionary, and he has, a, he has an opportunity in his mind that we'll do 1,000 transactions in a day. Mm-hmm. Inside like, of the organization. Inside the organization. Yeah. Like, how do you do that? Mm-hmm. It's a lot of people and processes. Mm-hmm. And it's not you on the whip, cranking the whip behind somebody to make sure they work. It's them going out there and doing it because yeah. you provided all the tools for them to do it. And they're just doing it because it's profitable. All right. I love it. So what does someone get if they're using the Hive My CRM? They get, for one, access Right, so uh, it's, it's us doing a one weekly coaching call. Um, they get the CRM, and a mm-hmm. CRM can be a pain in the butt, right? Mm-hmm. So you got to get in there, you got to set it up, you got to upload your list, you got to set your automations, you got to have all these different pipelines and automated responses. Right. Um, our customer service department does it for them, mm-hmm. so it's completely hands off. Like you don't even have to know how to use it. Uh, for one, um, they get access to the community knowledge. Uh, we literally help. Like we'll jump on the phone and negotiate. We'll yeah. go out and raise the capital. So all it is like it's like a us like shining a. You know the Batman signal? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's the hive mind signal. Like, come yeah. check this out, guys. Trust me, it'll be yeah. worthwhile. Yeah. Gotcha. So if someone wants to join, I'm looking here, hive mind disruptors.com, H I V E M I N D disruptors.com, or text red to 210-972-1842. That's it. That's it. Okay. And then if they join that, then they get access to you guys in the group coaching to learn 
in greater detail what we talked about today. Absolutely. Gotcha. All right. I mean, that sounds like a steal. Um, <laughs> we think it is. <laughs> we think it is. Like, yeah. We we had a we have a student. He was working at Costco. He had a few opportunities to come up, and uh, it takes takes people like six to six months or so to kind of understand what we're looking for. Mm-hmm. Some people pick it up faster, and I think it's based off your individual like knowledge and skill level. But I mean, we have like single mom in there. She's got a few opportunities we're working on. Like it, it's just cool to see people working and creating large opportunities that they they might not even. Like we tell people don't buy it with your wallet. Mm-hmm. You're not buying these deals with your wallet because we're gonna get creative finance. Yeah. So and we'll and we'll raise the money. So if you're a part of the community, you have access to all of our resources mm-hmm. just by being a part of it. Yeah. Gotcha. So you have you have like new new students making fifty thousand, hundred thousand right assignment fees on the first deal. The mailman made fifty thousand on his first deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of our students is gonna make over a million on his first deal. So great first deal. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty cool uh, niche to be in. Uh, I don't think that points to like the genius of mm-hmm. Daniel or myself. Mm-hmm. It's just uh, where there's bigger numbers involved. Uh, there's a lot more profit involved. And uh, I think in my mind, somebody mm-hmm. sends me a four acre track and I get butterflies like mm, I don't want to look at it. Mm-hmm. I don't want to put that much time and energy into something that's going to produce you know small right. ROI. But if somebody sends us a hundred acres, we're all mm-hmm. over it. Right. And we're like, oh dang, where's this at? What are because you talk about you know like the upside and like. It, it sounds fairly simple, mm-hmm. not necessarily easy, but fairly simple. It's not really complicated. There's not a ton of moving parts. And you were saying earlier, like if it's if you didn't, if it's not a great deal, you can force appreciation. Mm-hmm. What's the downside with the strategy? I think buying too far away from the city where there's no buyers. Mm-hmm. So we bought a hundred acres in a place called Orange Grove, Texas, last year, and we still have like thirty percent of it after about a year. Mm-hmm. Right, we got it for super cheap. But it's not moving, right? right. So um, I think that getting stuck with the property. Uh, we found a group of investors by Dallas that mm-hmm. bought three ranches to do the same strategy. Um, the guy that led them into this strategy didn't know what the heck he was doing. Mm-hmm. And now they went in. How much did they go into the deal? They, they bought it too high, and then they borrowed against it to get timber equipment. No, yeah. but what, what do they got total cash out of pocket into it? Oh, it's like two, they bought uh, 250 acres for three and a half million. Mm-hmm. So their average like 12,000 an acre. And... We would have bought it at nine and exited at eighteen. They bought it at like twelve, thirteen, and they incurred debt. With now they're at like seventeen, eighteen per acre. So now there's no way to exit the property without large cash injection. Mm-hmm. So that's the next thing now. So now you got three and a half million stuck into a deal, and the only way to get out of it is to raise more capital to force appreciation on it. So that, right. there's a problem. Um, going in fifty thousand worth of engineering and earnest money and all that, and then it turns out you can't do it what you thought you wanted to do with the mm-hmm. property. Or after us having it under contract for three months or six months, there's no buyers coming, mm-hmm. right? So now you've already like, because we don't wait to close. We start engineering immediately. We start surveying off, like we're ready to go, yeah. right? So normally we try to make sure that it's a sure bet when mm-hmm. we go into it. But yeah, you can lose ten or $50,000 worth of earnest money on a single deal. So I think even more reason to have that guidance going with somebody who's experienced as opposed yeah. to just saying like, oh, I saw that, that podcast on mm-hmm. real estate disruptors. Those guys are doing it. We could do it too. Right. Um, I think well, it's, be, it's really yeah. easy to forget about the things that can go wrong, mm-hmm. right? Because we hear Absolutely. things like, oh, that sounds great. I'm going to go jump in all in and this and that. So paying too much, which is, I mean, I guess it's an experience component uh, or, or, or guidance component. Mm-hmm. And then buying too far, which is really the same thing as paying too much. I mean, you shouldn't buy it at all if it's too far. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anything else? Um, I think paying with your own cash. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing that we've noticed, and this is this is crazy, land has trillions of dollars of dead equity. Mm-hmm. It's dead. Yeah. In the property, just sitting there, they've owned it for fifty years, and it's passed on generation generation. Mm-hmm. And it's literally, it takes something like us to unlock it. Mm-hmm. So it's to your detriment to pay cash for things. There's people that do what we do; they buy everything cash. I'm like, why would you buy it cash? Mm-hmm. You're crazy. Every one of these sellers has equity. You can ask for seller financing. I don't care how much they how much they want down. If it's a good opportunity and you can get that thing with fifty percent down, buy that deal mm-hmm. because you can leverage seller financing. Right. So there's a lot of equity there that you can play with and maneuver and get creative with. And I'll yeah. leave, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I was going to point at some other landmines. Um, you can come across an endangered species. Oh yeah. Right. Florida floodlands, wetlands. Mm-hmm. Um, just like uh, you can get pushback from the county. So right now we're looking at buying a deal west of San Antonio where the developers pissed off the city and the county. Mm-hmm. So now they don't want to do business with them. So they're making it extremely difficult uh, for them to be able to do business there. So those are some landmines. Um, 
things that you got to watch out for, um, type of soil that's on property, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes uh, if you're looking to do a development and it's not the best for like septic systems, that kind of thing. Uh, access, no access to utilities. No groundwater, right? Yep. In, in Texas, we have groundwater, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so if there's no public utility district or co-op water, uh, you can drill wells and you can produce water that way. Mm-hmm. But in some areas, there's no groundwater at all. So again, it's just like knowing what all those little nuances are and, and I think just following somebody in, right? Into your yeah. first handful of deals. And then after that, you can go off on your own and do right. whatever you want it to do. But yeah, lots right. of, definitely lots of pitfalls. Yeah, getting here. some guidance. Yeah. So um, why, what is your why? Man, if you had asked me five years ago, I would have said my family. Mm-hmm. But I think once you get yourself comfortable and you get your family comfortable, um, my my mind automatically starting to go, well, how big can we scale this thing? Mm-hmm. Right. Because I see a lot of things that are happening around the globe, right. With the famine and, and limited access to resources. When I was doing that solar company, uh, I had, I was trying to track leads for people that wanted solar. So I threw an ad on Facebook. Uh, it was actually Craigslist. Like, Hey, solar panels for free. Right. So they can call me and I'm like, we'll get you hooked up. Mm-hmm. This guy called me, he was in Mexico and he's, he was in tears. The guy's like, we have no electricity in our building. It's like, I really need those solar panels. And man, I started to cry. And I was, and so that, that from that day forward, I said, I'm going to start working on infrastructure in places where they need it the most. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, just thinking about all the different needs. So we have a lot of different charities and nonprofits that we have on our radar, things that are important to us. Um, that's my why. I want to start to move capital at a scale <clears throat> where we can start to make an impact and, and things that are important to us all over the planet, not just in the United States. But that's my why, man. I, I, I reached the point to where I fancy cars and shiny things. I don't own a Rolex. Mm-hmm. Um, those things are so insignificant to me. Uh, I want to be able to, to scale this thing up make a large volume of capital so that I can move it into things that are important uh, that, that would reach far beyond like the people that I know, like my immediate sphere of influence. Yeah. That's my why. That's awesome. <laughs> How about you? Um, for me is more of the, on the information side. I think um, one, one of the big reasons why I dove so hard into the, into the podcast side is because there's no readily information about land in general. And I think it's, you don't know the impact you can make over a lifetime of just producing content. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said, I, one of the other reasons why I love uh, just creating is I can't have my, my daughter, my daughter's six and four, and I have a son who's three. I can't have these conversations with them right now. So I want to have and record this information for them and other generations to listen to forever. I don't know what the future holds, but hopefully this information will be out there for a very long time and people mm-hmm. can learn and start taking action. And um, it's evergreen. That's so why I love doing stuff like this. It's evergreen content. So you don't necessarily know the, the impact and influence you have on communities that you never speak to. And I think you've under, you understand that most yeah. after doing this for five years. You don't know, the, it, you don't know re- the really true impact you make just by providing the information. Mm-hmm. So he's more on like providing the physical stuff. I'm more on like the information side of let's make this information readily available. That way we can make a large impact in this uh, untapped resource of a blue ocean of land. If I could add a 2.0 and kind of what he said and something too that's been real heavy on my heart is that we grew up super, super poor, man. Like a lot of people have that story, right? That background. Um, we, you know, we had to live with family a couple of times growing up. I mean, it's like my dad didn't have land. Mm-hmm. His dad didn't have land, right? So the, a lot of the land that we're finding, these big tracks that are like 500 acres, 1,000 acres, it's been concentrated only to a handful of families. Mm-hmm. And so that leaves a lot of other people that were disadvantaged that never had the opportunity to have land. So with what we're doing, we're breaking generational curses over mm-hmm. and over and over again for a living. So that's something that I'm furious about. Like this best kept secret, mm-hmm. if, it was, if this was out into the public a long time ago, then maybe my family and generations prior, you know, wouldn't have to go through that. So for us to be able to break generational curses for people at scale, it's like, dude, count me in. Like I'm at war. Yeah. Like I said, people have been telling us like, you guys need to keep it down about land. I was like, man, <laughs> I'm not going to be quiet. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so that's something that really, really drives me, man, is I, I want this opportunity to be afforded to everybody that's willing to play the game. They yeah. don't even need money. Yeah, I think it's great. It's incredibly, incredibly powerful. Um, what is your biggest struggle today? Um, biggest struggle, I think, right now is, is uh, personal or business. That's Any. <laughs> um, <laughs> personal, I think it's, it's always juggling, juggling work and business. Mm-hmm. I think everybody struggles with that. I love what I do because I work from home and he's on the ground running in the ranches. So mm-hmm. I kind of have the ability to like, I'm going to pick, I pick up my school. For, I pick up my daughter from school every day. And then sometimes I'm like, I got a meeting I got to go to. So I'll be right back. So I can kind of manage both. Um, I think it's my personal struggle. I'm business struggle. It's just people. I think we need more people in capital mm-hmm. and we can really do some amazing things. But um, it's, it's been an amazing journey from 
I've been doing, I've been an entrepreneur for six years now. So it's just been an interesting journey and kind of growing through different struggles that mm-hmm. you have through entrepreneurship because um, you hit different levels of growth at different times and hitting that next level and kind of breaking through those barriers has always been, it's been, it's been fun. I told Anthony, like, I think we're hitting like newer, higher levels. I'm like, I don't know if it's going to be as fun as it was when we were struggling. <laughs> uh, yeah, the hustle's different. The hustle's different, you know? The hustle's I, different. It's a lot more complicated problems with a lot more ramifications. Yeah, yeah, yeah more risk. Yeah, yeah. yeah more risk. Uh, I recently read a book, um, and what they talk about in there is every problem you solve creates a new host of other problems. Ooh, amazing. That's, that's an good. amazing observation. Right. That's good. And so it's like, yeah, like we solved this problem. Now we got these other problems. That not as many people have solved. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's what's cool too. Like I said, like, so now we're heading into these things where I'll tell you just some, uh, one of the things that I'm really focused on right now is uh, for, for teenagers that are depressed, that are struggling, right? Seeing suicide rates go up. So mm-hmm. we want to have like a, a fitness center type counseling center uh, for those people. Um, people that are, that have nowhere to go, right? Like, let's say like a single mother, they might have an abortion. Like, what if we had public housing for those people or, mm-hmm. or immigrants, you know, things that people wouldn't have to Veterans. worry about where they, they feel like their back's against the wall. So if we're going to start to move large volumes of capital, we're going to have large amounts of tax money to dump. Let's put into things that are important, yeah. right? That more so than like, hey, look at me. Now we have a thousand doors. Like our, our, our doors goal is zero, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> but yeah. through, through, uh, through the charities and the, and the nonprofit organizations that we want to set up, like we're going to end up with some doors as a byproduct of what we're already doing. Yeah. So uh, uh, challenges, I would say for one, for me, it's hard. It's hard to unplug because once I get obsessed with something, like I'm not, I'm not going to let go. Mm-hmm. So once I get home, it's like phone off. I put, try to put it away. We go to dinner, put the phone away. Um, that's something that I really struggle with is being able to unplug from my business because I love it. I tell, I joke. I say I don't have any hobbies, right? So I work out and I work, and that's about mm-hmm. it. Um, uh, but business wise, I think just capital, man. Uh, right now, um, our lead generation is working too tremendously. Right. So if we're going to continue to grow and scale, then we're again, that need for capital is going to be ongoing forever. So even after we raise a hundred million, like let's do another round. Yeah. Uh, because the lead flow is there. So yeah. those, are, those are the two challenges that I can think of first things first. Yeah. And I, I definitely resonate with that. Right. The, the, how do you unplug? Cause this is fun. Ask her, dude. Ask her. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to unplug, man. It yeah, really this is, is this, this is fun. We're, we're playing. This is not, this is not work. I love the game more than anything, man. I really, yeah. I enjoy it. I don't feel like, oh God, another day of work. Like I'm mm-hmm. just, I'm, I'm in it to win it. Yeah. yeah. What's your superpower? <sighs> Mine, man, I have to tell you, it's just brute strength. Right. And then being able to foresee the future. Mm-hmm. So once I have a vision and I know I'm going to, uh, like something that I'm going to focus on, I don't worry about the 99% of what else needs to happen until mm-hmm. I get there. Like I'll put in the hours, like physical, physical pain and mm-hmm. torture. Uh, I'm going to make it happen no matter what. So I think it's being able to power through challenges, uh, making sure that like all the little things that come along the way, like those like insignificant, insignificant, mm-hmm. I'm still going. And sometimes it is very painful and right? very painful to put in the hours and have the focus. But mm-hmm. it's just whatever I lack in intelligence, I think it's just brute strength and being yeah. able to see something through no matter what happens and, and being able to, to go through that pain and those challenges. No matter what. Yeah. You're going to make it happen. How about you? Um, I think my, my superpower is it's able to extract. It's to take large amounts of information and extract what's pertaining to me. Mm-hmm. It, he has a way of distilling down lo- large volumes of information into like two sentences. Yeah. It's, it's weird. It's weird because I, 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 I listen to like somebody whole speak, 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 speak. And it's a lot, a lot of people, they throw a lot of fluff into their, their book or their, their blog or their, their whole podcast episode. Mm-hmm. And then like. What are the action items for this thing that I read or listened to, and what am I going to do with it? So I, I have like an ability to pull and extract a paragraph, and we're going to implement it today. Mm-hmm. And that's my superpower. Yeah. Uh, well, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, I like to think I have the same one. And the biggest challenge is listening through someone's endless BS. <laughs> To get <laughs> that one thing, yeah, that one thing. It's so crazy because I'm like, I listened to like hours, and I'm mm-hmm. like, Oop, that was it. I'm good. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> the Grant Cardone book, like the book could have been a sentence long. Yeah, yeah like, why can't you just like, what was the point of all these other things? <laughs> but like, and I get it too because I, I think information is meant for people in different stages. Mm-hmm. So like, if you're reading a book about business and you've no experience in business, everything's gonna be like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. Mm-hmm. But like, people that have been in business for ten years. They're looking at that book completely different because they need to understand that lesson that a, a tenure business owner understands. Mm-hmm. So they're waiting for that one nugget to come across and like, ooh, that was it. Thank you. Everything else was fluff because I already experienced it yeah. hands on. Uh, uh, expression I heard recently, uh, apparently, or supposedly, it's a Chinese, um, 
I can't, I can't think of the word, right? It's Confucius saying something, something along those lines, but you know, a man never crosses the same river twice, mm -hmm. right? Because he's a different man and it's a different river. Amazing, yeah. Right, so it doesn't matter how many times he's gone across it. So kind That's of it. what you were saying there. Uh, so what book have you gifted more than any other? Um, book, I am not a reader. I'm not a reader at all. Podcast, audio book. Um, I've, I read, uh, I read Hormozzi's book. It was a really, really, I read, I read it once. And Which I, one? The first one. I haven't read the second one yet. $100 million offers? Yeah, yeah. So I read that whole book. And it's funny because, like, I read the whole book and everybody's like, like, there's no, like, it's, there's a lot of, like, actual items, but he really, don't, he really doesn't say what the thing he did was. Mm -hmm. And I pulled out of that whole book. Here's what he did. And then he says it in the $100 million leads what he mm -hmm. did. And I already had extracted it from his first book, even mm -hmm. though he never said it. Yeah. Gotcha. So. It's $100 million leads. Or $100 million offers. 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 That, that's good. In, in the spirit of being a Gemini, like, can I get two? <laughs> sure. Sure. Um, one is the, the power of now. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I, was, I was going through a dark time in my life when I came across that book. And I think that text is probably like the single most powerful thing I ever come across to like. No matter where you are in your life, like mm -hmm. if you just stop worrying about what happened before and what's going to happen into the future, you can concentrate all of your energy and power into that moment and just mm -hmm. stay there. And then everything becomes super easy. So I think that one for one. How? How is that? Or why is that the case? Because if you think about it, right, just like psychologically, if you're thinking about like the past, you, you end up depressed because you wish you could do things different or you mm -hmm. wish you would have made different choices. Mm -hmm. And if you're always thinking about the future, you're anxious of the future of what's mm -hmm. going to happen, what could go wrong, right? Because we're, we're trained to like outrun T-Rexes, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't die. Right. So we're worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. But if you if you can remove all that stuff, right, mm -hmm. and be like in the presence of God, right, like in the Bible or right, be, be, right. With, be with yourself or the power, whatever it is, mm -hmm. if you can concentrate all of that effort into that one space, I think you become ultra powerful because you're not like watering yourself down into the mm -hmm. past and into the future. Yeah. So um, that book, right, that really, really hit home with me. So I got into like real heavy into prayer and meditation, mm -hmm. right, to just be able to sit still and work through things. And I've noticed that after I come out of these sessions, right, whether it's 10 or 40 minutes, mm -hmm. right, we have a 10 commandments for our group. And part of it is meditation and prayer. Because I feel like if you reach down into that higher self, no matter what, you, you can have this problem that you've been chewing on for like three to six months. And then you come out of a 40 minute prayer session and you just solved it all without even thinking about it. Yeah. So I think that's powerful. I think uh, people should tap into that more often. I think it should be brought up more in business mm -hmm. because we want the practical steps. We want to read books and we want right. to watch shows and we want more knowledge. Mm -hmm. But sometimes re the removal of knowledge, right, is, is where the magic is. And the yeah. removal of information is where the magic is. And I'm real, real heavy into that. Gotcha. And then the second one, I'm going to say it wrong. It's at the Tao Te Ching, Te Ching mm -hmm. it, right? That's mm -hmm. probably one that I've recommended more than anything. And, and I myself found an audio on YouTube and I've probably listened to it like 200 times. Gotcha. So whenever, wow. the, whenever the storm does hit me, right, and you're mm -hmm. like, dang, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go from here. That's, I'll just put on that audio and I'll listen to it for like three days straight. Really? I'm at the gym listening to it. I'm driving around. I'm at the beach listening to it. Like just with my headphones on mm -hmm. nonstop. And again, I think it brings me back to center again to like say, don't worry about it. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen with or without your participation. Mm -hmm. So something I say like is when you run into like a personal or business challenge, Right. You can stress about it, but you're still going to get the same result, probably going to get a similar mm -hmm. result with or without your stress participation. Exactly. So that's something that I really, really pay attention to is like just when things seem like a storm is mm -hmm. coming. Right. Just calm down and relax. Mm -hmm. and, and things are probably going to work out in your favor because they normally always do. Yeah. And then removing that stress makes you more powerful because now you're not losing that 10 or 20 percent energy drain mm -hmm. from not being able to focus. So that's it. So I wish I had more like practical business books. Uh, no, I mean, those two books it. are, and I think they're very similar, right? Yeah. Because uh, uh, what, what's, we had Larry Yash on the show. He talked about like, if you worry about the past, it's uh, anxiety or anger. And you worry about the future, it's worry. Neither of which help you, right? And then the uh, Tao Te Ching, uh, I haven't read it yet. It's mm -hmm. on, it's on my kitchen counter, right? Like <laughs> someone told me to read it. It's like, okay, so I bought it. Mm -hmm. And it's just sitting in the kitchen counter. So I got to pull it up and, and, and read it. But I mean, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of power in knowing that um, if you just focus on what's at hand, because that's the only thing you can control, and give yourself permission to not worry about the other things. But for most people, it's really hard to do. It's so easy to get caught up in everything that's going on around us, right? The information age, when we're supposed to become smarter and wealthier mm -hmm. than ever, people actually get consumed by the information, right? You spend too much of your focus and your time and energy. And you, dis you, you distribute them all into mm. all these different things, sports and the kids and the wife and the family and, mm. and, and social media. So when you, when you think about it, there's nothing left of you. Right. Right. So I think when you spend that time with God or, or higher power, whatever it mm. is, 
then you go inside yourself and, and, and you can commune with God. I'll just give you one quick example. Sure. Um, it was, a, I think it was like Dan Rather. It's one of those famous right guys. Mm -hmm. And he's interviewing Mother Teresa. And he said, you know, what do you say when you talk to God? And she said, nothing. I just listen. Yeah. And then he said, oh, that's interesting. What does God say? And she said, nothing. He just listens. And again, one of those boom, epiphany mm -hmm. moments where like, wow, mm -hmm. really spending that time in silence and that communing with yourself, with your mm -hmm. higher power, that's where everything lies. And yeah. there's not an instruction manual, right? So God's not, not out there giving you like the whole Bible. Mm -hmm. But if, if, if you distill the whole Bible down, right? And a lot of spiritual texts, right? So I, I prefer the Bible, but there's, they're, they're all saying the very similar thing is that if you distill all that information down into nothing, it's just being where you are, being in that present moment mm -hmm. and being, having that communion with God or the higher power. And that's where everything lies. That's where you can create worlds. Yep. Um, what are some last thoughts you'd like to leave all the listeners with? Um, again, for me, something uh, that, that I'm going to probably harp on for the rest of my life now is if you intend to, to do real estate or business and invest your own capital, it's going to be a long, sad road and you might end up dying broke. Um, I think everybody should immediately get good at raising capital and mm -hmm. make that your central point of focus. And then you can just point that at any good business model. And uh, I think that's a, the quickest path to wealth. Mm -hmm. I think uh, being open-minded, a lot of people, they get stuck in this rut that they think they're doing the right thing and that's the only way to, to get results. And I think we've, we've kind of, us, we've gotten a lot further than a lot of other people in a short amount of time because we're open-minded. I don't know it all um, and I don't presume to know it all, but I've learned from a lot of different people and strategies and different things that I've implemented that's created this hybrid model of what we do. And I think it's just being open-minded and to what's out there because you may think you know it all, but there's things that you don't even understand. Yeah. yeah. Every time we think we hit a new level, we meet somebody else and we're like back to elementary school. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we, we, we probably are the most open-minded entrepreneurs in the country mm -hmm. because we don't think we know it all. As soon as we meet somebody new that has great information, we immediately incorporate that into our brand and into our model and we run with it. Yeah. Humility and coachability. I mean, I think those are two of the, and they're, and they're one and the same, but it's, it's, so such an important attribute because the the thing that can turn me off more than anything else when i meet someone new is if they have it all figured out like, oh okay. no uh -huh. you, you give them a nugget and then they got an answer for you right away like yeah. ah, dang this isn't gonna go good yeah i was like all right i'm not gonna spend any more time with you because there's just nothing i think good can come from this relationship um so if someone wants to get a hold of you what's the best way for them to do that um i'm on facebook and instagram uh daniel hiveman on instagram i'm on twitter a lot enjoy twitter twitter's fun mm -hmm. um but yeah that's probably the best place how about yourself um simply man i prefer like a facebook messenger mm -hmm. i'm on there a lot so uh, i think that's probably the easiest place to get a hold of me and uh, it might take me a little bit to get back a couple of days but I, I try to answer everybody and then if you see me on social media like on instagram or on facebook or any of those i try to reply to every single comment like even if i reply a month later mm -hmm. so if somebody just reaches out through one of those public channels then uh, I'll get back for sure. But yeah, I don't have like a website or anything like that. That, that is right. my go-to. All right, perfect. All right, well, thank you so much. Dude, thanks Appreciate for having us, man. On. Yeah, this is like Appreciate one of our life awesome. accomplishments, dude. So oh, I'm and happy. I, I feel like we owe it in large part to you, man, because uh, you, 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 you put the show out, you put the good information into the mm -hmm. universe and uh, it fell on our ears and here we are now, man. So I want me, it's the same thing you were saying earlier. You're welcome. It was the same thing you were saying earlier, right? Like each one, teach one. It's that ability to pay for because you don't know who my impact what changes it's going to make. So. I think the waves that you're making on, on the planet and in the universe, man, with what you've created is just like, I can't thank you enough, dude. And, and even just for ourselves, the way things have gone, like I can imagine all the other people that you've impacted. It's yeah. just like, just to even think about it, it's, it's amazing, just beautiful. So thank you. No, oh, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you for coming on. We'll see you guys next Shout time. Shout out to Steve Train. Jump on the Steve Train. We real estate disruptors.